In a world full of hopes and dreams, it's important to take a step back and look at the way to our goals again. This isn't just another motivational speech about making goals or following your dreams. It's a call to a trip that will change your life. Today, we're going to talk about what it really takes to make your dreams come true. This journey isn't just a guide, it's the start of a big change in how you'll reach your goals in 2024. We are about to start a new year that is full of untapped potential and unknown territory. The questions that come to mind are, how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be? What does it take to break free from the limits of what most people think and really do what we set out to do? The first thing we'll do is question what most people think they know about making goals and reaching them. We talk about why taking a different approach, or even what some people call embracing the misunderstood art of being a fool, could be the key to finding less traveled but more rewarding roads. It's about being brave enough to go after what's important, even if it means being different from everyone else. Then we face a challenge that is modest but pervasive, the inner block that keeps many people from growing and changing. It's not just about age or stage of life, it's also about how you think. It's about figuring out the traps that keep us stuck in a state of extended childhood and becoming fully grown adults who are in charge of their own lives. We also talk about the constant search for success in a world where stories of success are often told in broad, generic terms. We go a different way. Today, we're going to talk about what success really means to you and how to make a plan for it that fits with your core values and goals. As we move into 2024, this journey is meant to give you the ideas, plans and points of view you need to make your dreams come true. It's about moving from wanting without doing anything to doing something with a reason. Let's change what it means to really reach your goals this year by going on this journey with me. It's easy to think that following the crowd is better in a world that is always getting more complicated, but there is a secret art to being what some might call a fool. I picture a tightrope walker taking that first extremely risky step. A lot of people might think that choice was stupid. Why leave the ground, which is safe? But for the artist, it's a dream, a passion, and an important part of who they are. In the same way, each of our lives is like walking a fine line between what society expects of us and what we really want. People often use the word fool in a lot of different, mostly nasty ways. People usually think that fools don't have any sense, knowledge, or insight. They are the clowns, jesters, and foolish dreams who aren't afraid to go off the beaten road. What if, though, there is deep knowledge hidden in the core of foolishness? A kind of knowledge that knows that life's biggest events and most important lessons often happen when things don't go according to plan. Throughout history, many scientists, thinkers and artists have not only hinted at this unique point of view, but have also praised it. Their beliefs and life stories teach us important lessons that make us question the way things are and want to see the world in a new way. A view that values boldness, bravery and the desire to go after things that might seem impossible at first. Now let's learn how to be a fool. In order to understand this idea, we have to look deep into the minds of people throughout history. People who are ready to be laughed at, confused and basically seen as stupid have made the most important discoveries, inventions and works of art. From artists who started avant-garde groups that were brushed off by their peers, to scientists who came up with new theories that turned conventional knowledge on its head, it was their stupid determination and faith in their dreams that paved the way for progress. But why is it so important to use this idea that doesn't seem to make sense? I believe that sincerity is the key to the art of being a fool. It's about staying true to yourself, even when other people want you to change. It's about having the guts to believe in our dreams, 
even if they seem impossible or far away. Not only does it give our lives purpose and meaning, but it also encourages other people to do the same. The rules and standards of today's society aren't always meant to stop us from following our dreams, but they do often push us to fit in. From a very young age, we are led down ways that are seen as safe and right. We are rarely told to think deeply, dream big, and follow our dreams with all our might. However, history has shown over and over that people who have truly lived happy lives and made a permanent mark are those who have learned how to be foolish. In this investigation, we're not just talking about the vague idea of stupidity, we're looking into a plan. Using the knowledge of well-known thinkers, scientists and writers who have all supported and accepted this art form in their own unique ways. From their points of view, we'll see that being a fool isn't about not knowing anything or being foolish. It's about having courage, desire and never giving up on your dreams. Before we start this trip together, I want you to let go of any ideas you already have, be open in heart and mind, and remember how deeply wise it is to be a fool. George Bernard Shaw once said, All progress depends on the unreasonable man, which in this case means the dreamer who won't give up, the fool who will never grow old. There is one storyline that runs through all the legendary stories. In these stories, gods, humans and animals of all kinds act out the timeless tragedies of life, a thread that seems to resonate with universal echoes regardless of society or time period. In his famous work, The Hero's Journey, Joseph Campbell wrote about this idea. In his groundbreaking book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell dug deep into the myths and stories of many countries and found something shocking. Behind the different parts of these stories was a monomyth or a single main story framework. It was the story of the hero, a person who leaves what they know, faces what they don't know, faces obstacles, and comes back changed. This trip around and around is a theme in many stories, from the Indian Ramayana to the Greek Odyssey, from the Bible story of Moses to current sagas like Star Wars. That being said, one might wonder what role the fool plays in this big story. At the beginning of the hero's journey, the main character often acts like a fool. This isn't a comment on how smart or skilled they are. It's about how innocent, interested and ready to go into the dark without a clear plan. The fool is not limited by what they know or what everyone else does. They follow their gut, follow their hearts and are always looking for new things to learn. They are driven into the journey by this stupidity, I think. Take the figure of Luke Skywalker from Star Wars as an example. At first, he is just a simple farm boy who doesn't know much about the Force or the universe as a whole. He is the perfect example of a fool because he is willing to take chances, follow a calling he doesn't understand, and enter a dangerous world. But it's exactly this innocence and stupidity that lets him start a journey that turns him into a Jedi and a hero. In the same way, the hero of many stories starts out as an ordinary person who is often laughed at, overlooked or ignored by those around them. In Tolkien's The Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins is at first seen as just a simple hobbit who doesn't like to go on adventures. But it's this very innocence, this touch of the fool, that makes his journey so interesting and life-changing. Campbell stressed that the hero's journey isn't just about going on adventures like fighting monsters, finding riches, or saving a princess in trouble. It's just as much, if not more, about the journey within, facing one's fears, doubts, and worries. The hero's problems in the outside world often reflect their problems inside, which is why the fool's traits are even more important in this internal setting. Because the fool is naturally honest, strong and flexible, these qualities help the hero learn, grow and win in the end. While this trip is exciting, it also comes with some risks and unknowns. There are many trials along the way, 
and the hero is always being put to the test. They have to deal with desires, their deepest fears, and questions about who they are. But the fool's unbreakable spirit, his or her ability to get back up after a fall, to laugh in the face of trouble, and to see the world with clean, new ease, is what makes the hero come back and change in the end. The fool, in effect, is the beginning, the spark that starts the journey. The difference between the fool and the hero starts to blur as the trip goes on though. Because every fool has the ability to be a hero and every hero has a bit of the fool in them. The deep meaning of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey is found in this careful dance between youth and knowledge, between weakness and power. That everyone, no matter how stupid they seem, has greatness seeds inside them, waiting for the right time to grow and change them. We find the deep thoughts of Friedrich Nietzsche, a philosopher whose influence lasts through time and challenges, our usual ideas about right and wrong, existence and the human spirit, when we delve deeper into the philosophical undercurrents that shape our understanding of the fool and the hero. The Übermensch, which is often translated as Superman or Overman, is one of Nietzsche's most important and perhaps most mistaken ideas. But who or what is the Übermensch? At its heart, Nietzsche's Übermensch is not a biological or physical better being, nor is it a call for a bad social order. Instead, it's a sign of a person who has been able to get past their own questions, social rules, and innate values to find their own meaning and values. Being an Übermensch means being able to rise above your limitations, going beyond what society, culture, and even history say is possible. They don't just take on ideas, they make them. They do more than just live life, they decide what it's all about. They are always at risk of being seen as strangers, rebels, or just plain stupid when they do this. Nietzsche says in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, one of his most important works, I teach you the overman. Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? What he means is that each of us should go on the greatest adventure of all, the adventure of overcoming ourselves. This trip isn't about giving up our humanity. It's about going beyond its limits and making our own destiny instead of letting fate hold us back. Getting to be the Übermensch, on the other hand, is not easy. Going against social rules, questioning what you've been told and looking for your own way can make you feel alone, laughed at and confused. In a world that was based on the Earth, Galileo dared to dream of a heliocentric universe. Vincent van Gogh painted images that the world wasn't ready to see. They were viewed as outliers, rebels, and yes, stupid in their time, as I mentioned. Even so, they were ubermensch in their own right, because they were brave enough to dream, create, and question on their own terms. Nietzsche thought that the rules, ideals, and morals we follow in society can become bonds that hold our spirit back. To get out from under these chains, you need the kind of boldness and guts that fools are known for. If you want to find your own greater truth, you have to be ready to be misread and thought of as a fool. In conclusion, both The Art of Being a Fool and The Hero's Journey are potent tales that have been told for a long time and in many different countries. They tell us how important it is to be real, have bravery, and learn about ourselves. The fool is more than just a figure in a story. He or she represents our inner strength to break away from social norms and standards. In the same way, the hero's journey shows how we all want to face obstacles, find our true selves, and come back changed. These ideas push us to accept our inner fool and go on our own epic trips where we face our fears, solve problems, and change what we believe in. I believe that by doing this, we can find our own greatness and live a life that is genuine and important. Let us remember the wise words of the fool and the hero as we try to make our way through the complicated world.
may we also find the courage to go our own way with boldness and purpose. The Overman gets away from these chains. They see the empty space, the fact that life has no purpose. Instead of giving up, they decide to fill the empty space with their own goals, beliefs and aspirations. I. In this case, to be an Ubermensch is to play the fool. It means walking on the thin line between what society will accept and what it will reject, and putting everything at risk for one's own vision. But it's also about realizing the power of will to change things, and realizing that we are not just Faith's toys, but active players in making our own lives. When we think about Nietzsche's words and his idea of the Ubermensch, we are reminded of how much potential we all have, the ability to question, challenge and rethink, the ability to be seen as a fool today and a genius tomorrow. We can see the complicated dance of life in this kaleidoscope of thought, where the fool, the hero and the ubermensch all mix. In this dance, being brave enough to dream, question and find your own way is both the biggest risk and the best prize. Carl Jung was a Swiss doctor and psychologist who went beyond the limits of traditional psychoanalysis. His ideas are mysterious and deep, and they help us find our way through the maze of human thought. In order to find out what it means to be human, Jung dug deep into myths, faith, and the common mind. The ideas of the shadow and individuation are at the heart of Jung's work. We have to go on a trip into these deep areas of self-awareness and change before we can understand our inner fool and how it links to our dreams and goals. The shade is often just around the edge of our aware mind. As Jung put it, this is not some evil force or substance. Rather, it is the unconscious part of the psyche that the aware ego doesn't recognize in itself. The shade holds memories, feelings, and wants that have been pushed down, avoided, or ignored. I don't want to accept anything about ourselves, including our fears, our flaws, and even our untapped potential. What does the shadow have to do with the fool? This is one way that the fool is like the ghost in its simplest form. People often tell us to hide or control our freedom, youth, and wild side, but the fool stands for these things. We have to face our shadow and accept the parts of ourselves that we've avoided or ignored in order to embrace the fool within us. It's about understanding our flaws, our weaknesses and our secret wants. Bringing in the darkness is the only way to become whole, real people. This brings us to Jung's idea of individuation, which means becoming the person you were born to be, not the person society thinks you should be. I'm on a path to self-realization where I bring my shadow and other aspects of my mind into my aware self. Individualization is not about becoming a perfect form of yourself. It's about balancing and getting along with others. In many ways, the fool's journey is like this process of becoming your own person. Like the fool, each of us starts a trip that is full of challenges, insights and changes. We get closer to our real selves when we face and accept our shadow, when we make peace with our deepest fears and wants. The fool's enthusiasm, wonder and innocence are very helpful on this trip because they help us go through each turn with an open heart and a ready spirit. This process is deeply connected to our hopes and dreams. They are basically the soul's desire to become whole and separate. Every dream whether it's a desire to make something, discover something, or connect with someone, shows a part of our mind that wants to be expressed in the waking world. Because they aren't afraid of anything, fools act as a link between these worlds, encouraging you to listen to our deepest desires, think big, and explore the vast landscapes of our minds. In one of his thoughts, Jung wrote, Those who look outside dream, those who look inside awake. This sums up what we've been talking about. We need to look inside ourselves, accept our inner fool, 
and start the road of individuation in order to fully understand and follow our dreams. It's a journey where the goal isn't a place, but a way of being, a way of being whole, real, and deeply aware of yourself. From Nietzsche's Ubermensch to Campbell's Hero's Journey, Jung's ideas add another level of meaning to the vast web of ideas. They tell us that the path is both inside and outside of us, and that every struggle, lesson, and dream is a step toward becoming our best selves. And on this trip, the fool is not only a friend, but also a lighthouse, shining its innocence, interest, and honest truth on the way. Albert Camus, a French-Algerian writer and philosopher, has created one of the most vivid depictions of the human state in the history of philosophy. Camus, who won the Nobel Prize, struggled with spiritual problems. He painted a picture of life where meaning is not given to us, but is something we create for ourselves in a universe that doesn't care about us. The idea of the absurd is at the heart of Camus's thought. Camus said that the absurd is the clash between our need for meaning and the universe's seeming lack of meaning. People naturally want to find meaning and purpose in their lives, but the universe, with its vastness and lack of interest, doesn't seem to have any meaning of its own. This clash of ideas is what the absurd is all about. But Camus didn't see the absurd as a pointless end. He saw it as a beginning, an understanding from which a real life could be built. In his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus tells the story of Sisyphus, who is stuck having to push a rock up a hill forever, only to have it roll back down every time he gets close to the top. For Camus, Sisyphus represents what it means to be human. Our efforts, battles and dreams may seem pointless in the face of the universe's disinterest. But it's when we strive, when we fight against the nonsense, that we find meaning. Aspirations, goals and dreams are important parts of this defiance. Because of its rules and systems, society often forces us to be logical. It points people in directions that offer safety, honor and acceptance. But these social norms often clash with the dreams we have for ourselves, dreams that may seem crazy or out of the ordinary. Camus's ideas give us the strength to follow our dreams, not despite the absurd, but because of it. If life doesn't have any purpose by itself and the universe doesn't care about us, then why not look for what makes our souls sing? Why not follow the road that feels right to us, no matter what other people think or expect? When we accept that life is silly, we are free from the restrictions of societal shoulds and musts. It tells us that societal rules are just as made up as anything else in the big random play of the universe. Living a life that fits with what other people expect of you is just as illogical as going after your biggest, craziest dreams. When we recognize and accept the absurd, we release the stress of trying to find objective meaning or meeting outside standards. We write our own stories that connect with our inner truths and become the writers of our own lives. This isn't a call to give up our responsibilities or wander randomly. Instead, it's an offer to follow our interests with all our might, to accept that life is unpredictable and to find joy in living itself, regardless of what other people say. It was Camus who said, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. In a world where rules and expectations can crush dreams, following one's true calling, no matter how strange or silly, becomes an act of rebellion against the absurdity of life and societal rules. When we think about Camus' ideas, we are aware of how acceptance can free us. Accepting that life is silly doesn't make you apathetic. It makes you free. It tells us that our time on Earth is very short in the grand dance of the universe. We don't have to follow the rules right now. Instead, we can choose to dance to our own beat, follow our dreams with all our hearts, and make a life that is strongly and honestly ours, 
even if it's only temporary. The lessons from Camus are a powerful potion in the continued story of the fool's journey. They tell us that sometimes the smartest thing to do is to believe in our crazy dreams, to find meaning in living, and to enjoy the beautiful, fleeting, and silly dance of life. Let Camus' vision guide us as we go forward, encouraging us to dream, to take risks, and to enjoy the deep freedom that comes from accepting that life is ridiculous. He doesn't play the normal games of one-upmanship or lying. This puts him in dangerous situations, but it also lets him stay true to himself, a shining example of honesty in a sea of lies. For Dostoevsky, this sense of reality is very important. It's obvious that when one has a deep understanding of oneself, being innocent and stupid can be more effective than being clever or socially aware. Michigan's goals and dreams are not based on what other people expect of him, but on an inner moral compass, a natural sense of what is right that has not been tainted by the world around him. As shown by figures like Prince Mishin, Dovi shows that the way to one's dreams is not a straight line full of smart choices and social approval. Instead, it's a twisting road where the heart, in all its stupidity and innocence, acts as a guide. In the Dostoevsky universe, dreams are very private. They shouldn't be changed to fit social norms. Instead, they should be followed with a strong sense of what's real. This wild chase is shown by Mishkin in all his stupid glory. His relationships, choices, and even mistakes are all based on a true sense of who he is, not on what other people think or feel. In a moving moment, Mishin says, beauty will save the world. This isn't just a comment on how beautiful something looks. It's a deep thought on how beautiful the human soul is in its purest, most honest form. Dovey thinks that this kind of beauty, this kind of realness, can change people, encourage them, and help them reach their true dreams. As we explore the complicated world of Dovi, Prince Mishkin shows up not only as a character, but also as a philosophy. He is a symbol of the strength of being honest and pure in a world where many people wear masks and follow the rules set by society. As we continue to study the fool's journey, characters like Michigan help us remember how strong real innocence can be. The Idiot by Dovey adds a deep layer. It tells us to understand the changing power of being true to our selves, and that sometimes the deepest knowledge comes dressed in the mask of stupidity in the pursuit of goals. It's not the societal accolades or validations that matter, but the authenticity of the journey, Dovey seems to say through his books. And it's this authenticity, with all of its ups and downs, that leads to the realization of dreams, which are painted not in the colors of the world, but in the colors of one's heart. When we walk through the halls of philosophy, we always come across Socrates. He was a person whose effect has been felt throughout time and has had a huge impact on Western thinking. Socrates is still remembered as one of the most famous thinkers in history. He was always looking for the truth and had a unique way of asking questions. He not only taught people how to think critically, but he also gave them deep insights into what information is and how important it is to be aware of oneself. The strange statement, I know that I know nothing, which is often credited to Socrates, shows how he thought about philosophy. It might seem like this statement is contradictory or even makes no sense at first, but it really does catch the core of Socratic wisdom, humility. In a world full of people who said they knew everything, Socrates admitted he didn't. But this wasn't a statement of failure or apathy. It was a recognition of how big the universe is and how little we understand about it. Socrates made it possible for people to keep asking questions and learning by admitting that he didn't have all the solutions. Socrates showed that humility is not about putting yourself down, but about knowing your flaws and being willing to improve. Socrates wasn't giving up when he said he didn't know something. 
Instead, he was pushing himself and others to learn more, question more passionately, and seek truth with fresh energy. Being humble can give you a lot of power, especially when you're trying to reach your goals. I find it freeing to accept that I don't know everything in a society that values total clarity and clear answers. It helps us take on tasks with an open mind, learn from our mistakes, and change our plans when things don't go as planned or when we fail. Realizing that we don't have all the answers can make us stronger and encourage us to come up with new ideas. Socrates' way of asking questions, which is called the Socratic method, was at the heart of his philosophy. Instead of giving straight replies, Socrates would ask a lot of deep questions that would lead his listeners on a trip of self-discovery and critical thinking. Socrates used this way to help people see through the layers of assumptions and get to the core facts, or lack thereof. Asking questions over and over again can have huge effects, especially when it comes to social norms and rules. We frequently run into social standards and well-worn roads on our way to our dreams, I believe. These rules can be helpful at times, but they can also be limiting, forcing us into certain roles and stifling our real goals. Socrates gives us a way out with the way he asks questions. By looking at these patterns with a critical eye and asking why, we can figure out which ones fit with our dreams and which ones don't. We can choose which social paths help us and which ones get in the way of our trip. I believe that by doing this, we can create a path that is truly in line with our goals. I would stress self-awareness, critical thought and resiliency if Socratic philosophy were to be condensed into its core regarding the chase of dreams. To chase your dreams doesn't mean simply following a set path. Instead, it means making your own way by asking questions, learning new things, and changing as you go. Socrates' modesty shows us that getting to our goals doesn't have to happen in a straight line. It is full of unknowns, difficulties, and times when you question your own abilities. But we really grow when we accept these unknowns, when we know our limits and still push forward. By looking closely at the social rules that shape our goals, we can also make sure that our dreams are truly our own and not just images of what other people expect of us. We can make sure that our journey, with all of its ups and downs, is real. Plato's conversations and the history of philosophy remember Socrates as more than just a thinker. They remember him as a rebel as well. He didn't just question ideas, he also questioned how people lived, thought and dreamed. The ideas that Socrates shared with us can help us as we continue to study how to be a fool and follow our dreams. They remind us of how strong it is to be humble, how powerful it is to ask questions, and how important it is to know ourselves as we go after our dreams. Socratic knowledge serves as a powerful reminder that it's the trip, not the goal, that counts, and that the questions, thoughts, and unwavering search for understanding are what really pave the way on this path. So, let us follow Socrates' example by always asking, thinking and looking for what we want as we passionately pursue our dreams. To make the dance of goals worth doing, you need to be aware of your own beat and take steps of critical inquiry. Among the deep voices that can be heard in psychology and philosophy, Viktor Frankl stands out as especially moving. Frankl was a Holocaust victim, neurologist and therapist. He didn't just write about pain and the search for meaning, he lived it. Because of his time in Nazi death camps, he came up with logotherapy, a way of helping people that is based on the search for meaning in life. It gives us a new way to think about what it means to be a fool and how brave it is to follow your dreams even when others don't. The primary driving force for people is the search for meaning, according to Frankl's logotherapy, which is both easy and complex. The idea behind logotherapy is that our greatest wishes are to find our purpose and meaning in life. 
This is different from other types of therapy that may focus on happiness or power as driving forces. No matter what, even the worst things that happen in life can have value for him. We didn't come up with this idea in the safety of a therapist's office. It was formed in the horrifying setting of death camps. In the middle of unimaginable suffering, Frankel noticed something very interesting. People who could find meaning or purpose in their suffering were stronger and able to handle the horrors with an almost supernatural strength. In a lot of ways, the people who were brave enough to look for meaning in the camps were foolish. They didn't listen to the outside story that tried to make them less human. Instead, they listened to the voice inside that told them they had a reason and that they were important. Even when things were very bad, they were stupid enough to dream, hope, and find bits of meaning. This is where the main idea of the art of being a fool meets Frankel's ideas. Following your dreams often takes the same kind of stupidity, the guts to look for personal meaning and purpose, no matter what other people think or what society expects of you. The challenge is to stay true to one's inner sense and put personal meaning ahead of what other people say. These outside forces can come from social rules, bad conditions or naysayers. Frankel was a good example of this. Even though the camps were horrible places to live, he never gave up on his dream of seeing his family again and sharing his ideas with the world. He wrote what would become his most important work, Man's Search for Meaning, in his head using bits of paper and stolen moments of quiet thought. The problems we face today may be different from the ones Frankel faced, but the main problem is still there. We are often torn between what society expects of us, the well-trodden roads and the set standards of success and our own search for meaning. In this case, being a fool is a brave thing to do. It means putting personal meaning ahead of social praise, looking for meaning in less traveled roads and often following dreams that the outside world might see as foolish or impossible. Frankel's logotherapy shows us that the search for meaning is deeply connected to our health, our well-being, and even our mental health. When our dreams are in line with our personal sense of meaning, we don't just reach outward goals. We answer an inner call. We feel a deep joy and happiness. Viktor Frankl's life and lessons can serve as a light of hope and a guide for anyone who wants to follow their dreams. His ideas tell us that real happiness doesn't come from being liked by others or achieving things that other people think are important. It comes from making sure that our actions are in line with our own sense of what they're for. In search of dreams, the fool turns into a dreamer who sees past the limits of the world and follows his or her own inner guide of meaning. Viktor Frankl's writings and the memory of Socrates encourage us to be brave fools, to boldly follow our dreams, to question, to look for meaning, and to value the deep over the surface. The steps of critical inquiry, led by the search for meaning and the beat of self-awareness, are what make the dance of goals valuable, in my opinion. I, in Frankel's philosophy, is the person who dares to stand up to chaos in the outside world, who looks for meaning even when it's hidden in hardship, and who, amidst the noise of social voices, listens carefully to the inner word of purpose. Viktor Frankl serves as a living example of the resilience of the human spirit and the transforming power of personal meaning as we continue to look into the art of being a fool. His legacy tells us to be brave enough to follow our inner calling, to look for meaning in the middle of chaos, and to be determined to follow our dreams with a sense of purpose. Ralph Waldo Emerson was an American philosopher, writer, and author who lived in the 1800s. He is a famous figure in the fields of transcendentalism and individualism. His ideas, which are most clearly shown in his article, Self-Reliance, have not only changed the way Americans think, but they have also taught us a lot about personal freedom, not fitting in, and the spirit of following dreams. 
The thought of Emerson adds another interesting layer to our study of the art of being a fool. Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance, starts with a powerful statement. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. The essay is basically telling people to believe in their own thoughts and feelings. Emerson thought that being self-reliant meant being true to your own ideas, values and beliefs without letting social rules or outside forces change them. One of the most convincing points of the article is that society often works together to take away people's freedom by forcing its rules, standards and ideas of what success means. Society can pull people away from their true ways. This makes people live their lives not according to their true calling, but according to what society says they should do. The thought of not conforming is a key part of self-reliance. Emerson makes a case against the push from society to fit into pre-made models. He writes, Whoso would be a man must be a non-conformist. By saying this, he doesn't just encourage rebellion for the sake of rebellion, he's also stressing how important it is to be yourself. In the context of our conversation, this lack of uniformity is very similar to the idea of being a fool. It takes guts to be seen as different, to risk being called weird or quirky, and to follow your dreams even if they go against what society thinks you should do. Emerson thinks that being so stupid is a trait, not a problem. It shows that a person is willing to put their own beliefs ahead of what other people think. Emphasis on feeling is at the heart of Emerson's thinking. He thought that everyone has an inner guide, a light that shows them the way on their own unique road. Even though reasoning and reason are useful, our intuition or gut feeling should tell us what to do, especially when it comes to big decisions in life and following our dreams. When we are pursuing our dreams, depending on our gut feelings can often lead us down strange roads that don't always fit with social norms and might seem silly to someone looking on from the outside. But Emerson says that this foolishness, this unshakable faith in one's own voice, is exactly what can lead to real happiness and great success. When we look at Emerson's ideas about self-reliance in the context of following your dreams, we can learn a lot. Real dreams versus societal expectations. A lot of the time, what we think are our dreams are actually societal expectations, goals that are shaped not by our inner wishes, but by stories from other people. Emerson's call for independence makes us think about our own dreams and figure out which ones are truly ours and which ones are just what society expects of us. People might think you're crazy if you follow your real dreams. It's to go into the unknown, not because you want to get praise from others, but because you want to feel complete. Emerson's focus on not fitting in helps us remember that this risk, this stupidity, is worth it on the way to our goals. There will be obstacles, times of doubt, and forks in the road. In this case, Emerson's focus on feeling shows the way. In this case, it tells us to trust our inner guide and follow our true thoughts and instincts. In today's world, where social pressures and outside approvals often take precedence over personal wants and intuitions, Ralph Waldo Emerson's thought is a welcome change of pace. His ideas about being independent are like a rallying cry, telling us to love who we are, to treasure our individual dreams, and to go after them with a passion that isn't slowed down by what other people think. In the dance of ambitions, there will always be tunes and words from outside that try to tell us what to do and how to do it. Emerson, on the other hand, says that our dance should be guided by the internal tune, the unique beat of our heart. Emerson stands out as a star in the ongoing study of the art of being a fool, shining a light on the benefits of not fitting in, the strength that comes from being truly independent and the life-changing effects of following your dreams. He tells us to be brave enough to believe in ourselves, to pay attention to our inner voice, and to start the magical path of pursuing our true dreams. 
The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho has captured readers all over the world with its enthralling story and deep spiritual lessons. The book is about a lot of different things, from love to fate, but one of its main ideas is that everyone should look for their own personal tale. Paolo not only gives readers a fun trip through Santiago's journey, but also a deep lesson on how important it is to follow your dreams, even if it makes you look like a fool. Santiago's trip starts with a dream in which a child tells him to find wealth at the base of the Egyptian pyramids. A lot of people thought this dream was just a fantasy or an illusion, but it set off Santiago's big journey. This is the first lesson. Dreams often hold deep truths and paths for our lives, even if they seem impossible. Many people would have thought that Santiago's dream was silly, but he decides to go after it anyway, which is the start of his journey. Paolo defines a personal tale as the deepest wish, the dream or goal that a person believes is their life's purpose. He says that everyone has a personal tale when they are young, but as they get older, rules, fear of failing, and other things take their attention away from their dream. As a shepherd, Santiago could have easily gotten used to the steady pace of his life. Still, the pull of his personal fame and the need to figure out his dream push him into the unknown. His journey, which was full of surprises and difficulties, is similar to the trip everyone takes when they decide to follow their inner desires. From the outside, Santiago's trip may have looked like a bad idea. He sold his sheep, gave up the security of his life, and went to a foreign country based on a dream. This seems like the stupid thing to do. But Coelho's story shows that it's this very stupidity, this daring spirit, that's needed to find out who you really are and live out your personal tale. When Santiago meets the alchemist, the story goes into more depth about the spiritual and intellectual parts of following your dreams. The alchemist tells him that people figure out early on in life what their purpose in life is, but not many people follow the road that has been set out for them, the path to their own stories and happiness. This supports the idea that many people choose the safety of what they know over the magic and danger of following their dreams because they don't want to be called fools. Usually, alchemy is about changing base metals into gold, but Paolo uses it as a metaphor for changing who you are. As Santiago gets closer to his personal fame, his trip isn't just about traveling, it's also about how he changes as a person. This change is important for everyone who wants to follow their dreams. In order to reach one's greatest goals, one must let go of old views, accept new knowledge, and keep growing. When Santiago learns that the prize he was looking for was not only physical, but also spiritual, his trip comes full circle. He learned a lot and understood what his heart really wanted. He also realized that the trip with all of its problems and diversion, was just as important as the goal. Coelho seems to be saying that while the end goal is important in our quest for our personal stories, the trip, the experiences, the changes, and the knowledge we learn are just as important, if not more so. Through the story of Santiago, Paulo Coelho gives us an interesting look at how to be a fool. It's a warning that the way to our greatest wishes, our personal tales, is often to do something strange, risk being laughed at, and go on a journey into the unknown. The alchemist shines a light on the strength of faith, the beauty of the trip, and the life-changing magic of following one's dreams in the dance between fate and free will, between dreams and reality. In a world that often puts practicality a hit of passion. The alchemist is a rallying cry for all dreamers, telling them to accept their silliness, listen to their hearts, and start the holy journey of making their personal stories come true. It's not just a story about Santiago's journey, it's a call to every viewer, every person, to go on their own trip of self-discovery, dream chase, and personal chemistry. 
We've traveled through the ideas of some of the deepest thinkers and stories in history as we've explored the complicated dance between dreams and courage, between foolishness and happiness. In their own special ways, each of these great people leads us to the same truth. Accepting our inner fool has immense power. From Coelho's The Alchemist and Santiago's unwavering search for his own legend, to Nietzsche's brave idea of the Übermensch, who is brave enough to make his own values, and from Jung's deep insights into the shadow and individuation, to Emerson's passionate support for self-reliance, each story and philosophical position paints a picture of a world where dreams aren't just fleeting fantasies, but deep prophecies that lead us to our true selves. As you can see, dreaming isn't just a frivolous thing to do, it's a way to fight against the world. It's a rebellion against the everyday, a challenge to social systems, and most of all, a brave pledge to oneself. Daring to dream is like starting a quiet but strong revolt against the way things are done. The fool that lives inside all of us isn't a sign of innocence or stupidity. It's a sign of bravery, the ability to go beyond the familiar and dive into the vast seas of the unknown. The world often wants us to follow a straight line, a road that we know will lead to safe choices and good decisions. However, Socrates' deep statement tells us that real knowledge may lie in understanding how much we don't know, asking the rules, and experiencing the immense freedom that comes from being humble. We have permission to be completely stupid, to question the obvious, and to leave our mark on the sands of time, thanks to IT Victor. Frankel's sharp ideas about logotherapy shed more light on this conversation by showing that our inner desires are often linked to our search for meaning. In all its depth, this search often requires us to be brave, enough to be stupid and look beyond the obvious and the palpable in order to find what really speaks to us. In the end, the fool isn't the person who dreams. It might be the person who hides their goals out of fear of being laughed at or failing. Because ideas give us more than just hope. They show us the way. They give us a reason to live. It takes a lot of guts to believe in yourself trust the trip and understand that the road, with all of its turns and twists, is just as important as the goal. As we come to the end of this journey through thought, theory and story, let's take with us the rich fabric of ideas we've gained. Let us respect the fool inside us by recognizing its strength, intelligence and bravery. Because the art of being a fool is the art of really living, of dreaming, being brave, and breaking the rules that hold us back. Accept your inner fool. It holds the key to a life full of dreams, desire, and meaning. In every great story, from old myths to current movies, the main character goes on a trip that changes them. It's a story of becoming, from being dumb as a child to being wise as an adult. What if, though, this trip this very rite of passage seems to be stopped, stalled, or interrupted. If Peter Pan decided not to leave Neverland, what would happen? There are changes going on. The old customs and practices that used to help us find our way from childhood to adulthood have changed or faded completely in this day and age. No longer are there clear-cut rites of passage into manhood. Gone are the days when leaving home, getting a regular job, or starting a family were typical signs of having grown up. When we get to the 21st century, we find a strange phenomenon. A large group of young guys who seem to be stuck in a state of childhood all the time. This isn't just an image that's shown on shows or laughed about at family events. It's a fact of life that has real effects on economies, family structures, and the minds of those who are affected. There's no need to explain the numbers. In the last few decades, there has been a big rise in the number of young guys, mostly in their 20s and 30s, who still live at home. In 2020, the Pew Research Center found that 52% of young adults in the United States lived with one or both of their parents. 
This is the highest number of young adults living with their parents since the Great Depression. But it's not just about where people live, and the jobless rate is also a cause for concern. There has been a steady drop in the number of young guys who are working. There are many reasons for this, such as technology and changes in the global economy. But the personal stories are usually about feeling powerless or not having enough opportunities. A lot of people say they feel outmatched, behind, and often not at home. The social and mental states of these guys show signs of growth problems that go beyond money issues. A study from the American Psychological Association found that people in this group are reporting more loneliness, aimlessness, and a feeling of being stuck. They don't seem to be able to reach the traditional signs of growth, and sometimes they don't even seem to want to. These facts and figures aren't meant to shame or judge. They're a call to learn, care, and most importantly, look for ways to make things better. If we're going to help these young guys become adults, we need to figure out what this modern mystery is all about. So why is this taking place? Why do so many young guys feel lost in the maze of life in a time when there is so much knowledge and chance? I know it's easy to blame modern society or the whims of the younger generation, but that's a simple explanation for a complex problem. We need to dig deeper to really figure out what's going on here. We need to learn from the writings of thinkers, scientists and mythologists who were some of the smartest people in history who studied people. What lessons, signs or directions did they leave behind that could help us find our way? In the past, how did people figure out what it meant to be a man? What does the way our society is set up now add to this problem? And can old myths, like the ones Joseph Campbell explained, help a young man who is lost on his own hero's journey? Come with us as we dig into this fascinating investigation, looking for not only solutions, but also ways to revive the age-old fire of growth, duty and adulthood because every young man should have a hero's journey and every society can learn from the stories of those who have been there. Joseph Campbell, whose name is linked to folklore and the human experience, created a system that works for people from all over the world and time. This basic idea is called the monomyth and it's at the heart of many myths, tales and stories from all over the world. At its core, it's not just a theoretical idea, it's a reflection of our own lives, the struggles we face and the changes we go through. Campbell once said, myths are public dreams, dreams are private myths. By saying this, he emphasized that stories that have been told for hundreds of years or even thousands of years have a similar structure because they are based on the experiences that people have in common the quests of Greek heroes, the spiritual travels in old Indian books, and the experiences of modern superheroes all follow the same pattern. Campbell said that this trend is the hero's journey. Before we can understand the hero's journey, we need to understand its three separate parts, departure, introduction, and return. The hero leaves the known world at the start, which is marked by separation. It's a moment of change that calls into question the status quo. Sometimes the person chooses to be alone, and sometimes they are forced to. Think about Luke Skywalker's poor beginnings on Tatooine, which seems very far away from the rest of the world until something unexpected happens that sets him on a path that he will never forget. This stage is like leaving home for the first time, starting college, or beginning work for a lot of young guys. It's a painful but necessary break from the familiar. The most important part of the trip is the second step, called initiation. This story has a lot of challenges for the hero, who meets both friends and foes, and wins and loses. As you grow, you improve your skills, question your views, and find out who you are. Campbell's focus on this stage is very important. It's not the end goal that shapes the hero, but the trip. In terms of our young guys, think about the many hurdles of becoming an adult, 
such as starting a job, making friends, dealing with failure, and enjoying personal successes. It is through these events, both bad and good, that they grow up and become more mature. The last part is the return. After going through the trials and learning, the hero has to go back to the world they know, taking with them the knowledge and gifts they gained on their trip. This isn't just a physical return, it's also a symbolic one that shows how the person has changed from what they used to be to what they are now. For young people, this could mean reaching a certain amount of security, like having a family, or it could just mean getting a better sense of who they are and where they fit in the world. The rituals of initiation of young men in some of the very simple societies are extremely interesting. The boys are brought up to be in fear of the masks that the men wear in their rituals. These are the gods. These are the personifications of the powers that structure the society. The boy, when he gets to be more than his mother can handle, the men come in with their masks or whatever the costume is, and they grab the kid. He thinks he's been taken by the gods, taken out into the men's ground, and he's beaten up and everything else. But then, there in New Guinea, there's a wonderful event where this poor kid has to stand up and fight a man with a mask. That's say, he's fighting the god. The man lets the kid win, takes the mask off, puts it on the kid. Now, the mask is not there, defeated, and simply said, oh, this is just myth said the mask represents the power that is shaping the society and has shaped you. And now you are a representative of that power. That's a big story. And there are quite a number of examples around the world. Down in Tierra del Fuego, the owner people down there had rituals of this kind, where the kid had to get up and fight this god power that he had always been afraid of. And the man put up a good fight for the kid, you know, but then the boy won. Now, you're a man. You've broken past the image as fact and understood the image as metaphor, and you are to represent what the metaphor stands for. What does the hero's journey have to do with how young guys today become adults? One interesting thing to notice is that a lot of people seem stuck in the introduction process. Even though they aren't close to their childhood, they are still going through the hard parts of the introduction and can't seem to find a way out. Society's expectations, their own fears, the economy, and often a lack of clear purpose or direction are the dragons they have to deal with, not magical creatures. Their fights are private, quiet, and not always recognized. This long start can be caused by a number of things. With so many options, the modern world can make you feel like you can't do anything. Because social norms are changing, traditional adult goals may seem hard to reach. With all the similarities on social media sites, the digital age can make people feel even worse about not being good enough or being left behind. In stories, the journey was often made easier by having clear enemies and problems to solve. Now, the trip is more vague and personal. In old times, heroes had teachers who helped them find their way. Today, many young guys feel like they're on their own, without anyone to point them in the right direction. The path to the return step is still unclear without these guides, but noticing this long-term start is the first thing that needs to be done to fix it. When young men know where they are on the hero's journey, they can find the guides, experiences, and knowledge they need to move forward and reach their personal return. Campbell's theory is beautiful, not only because it analyzes, but also because it gives us hope. No matter how bad the odds are, every person has the chance to win. By creating environments of understanding, offering resources and direction, and recognizing the unique challenges of modern adults, society can also contribute by understanding this journey and realizing its universal usefulness. Our young men can finish their hero's journey with our help. After all, every hero should come back victorious. In New Guinea, there's a ceremony where the man who initiates the child covers his eyes and the borer comes over. Now, the demon dragon grandpa is coming to eat you.
he says, these are no longer there. That's the Libao idea that Wagner takes care of. You think you're dead, and then bing, you got past it. Your life has changed and grown. You're taller. The childish ego is what has died. Until we're 12, 13 or 14 years old, we count on our parents and society for everything. People learn to depend on others, give up their rights, ask for acceptance, expect to be corrected, and other similar things. But how are we going to break free from that psychological grip and become self-responsible ones? Courage to say what we think about our lives. It's hard to get rid of the childish ego, which is based on dependence, and grow into the adult ego, which is based on power. The fight with the dragon is the most important part of every story, tale, or fable that speaks to us. Campbell sees the dragon as more than just a monster. In the stories, it represents our darkest fears, problems, and questions. It's a metaphor for the huge problems we have to solve in order to reach our full potential. When young guys are trying to figure out how to be adults today, these dragons take on very real and emotional forms. Fear is the first of these dragons that many young guys have to face. There is a lot of doubt in the world outside of the safe cocoon of youth. It can be very hard to do anything when you're afraid of not being good enough, of failing, or of not living up to social standards. This fear is stronger now that there is so much information available. They feel more afraid every time they see a peer who seems to be way ahead of them on social media or in real life. It's the fear that says, what if I'm not cut out for this? Or what if I can't find my way? And then there's the huge dragon of social forces. With all of its rules, standards and opinions, society can feel like a tight net. When are you going to settle down? Isn't it about time you got a steady job? When are you going to be with someone? Even though these questions seem harmless, they reflect society's idea of what a good adult life is like. It can be both a guide and a chain, reminding them all the time of the goals they haven't reached and the boxes they still need to check off. The last one, and maybe the scariest, is personal fears. These are the bruises and scars from the past, the complaints that you take to heart, and the negative thoughts about yourself that get in the way of your growth. It's the voice that tells them, you're not smart enough, strong enough, or worthy enough. This dragon, which is quiet but strong, throws a shadow over their journey and frequently changes it, or stops it altogether. Campbell explained, though, that the dragon isn't just a threat, it's also a chance. Face the dragon isn't just about beating an outside threat, it's a deep moment of personal growth. Young guys don't just move forward on their trip, they change when they face their fears, question social rules, and work through their own doubts. This fight is more than just a fight, it's a rite of passage, they rise from the chrysalis as men who have accepted who they truly are, not as boys. But what does this real self look like? From Campbell's wise words, it sounds like finding your own personal tale or unique calling. To take a phrase from another great thinker who wrote The Alchemist, the personal tale is what you should have done all along. It is your deepest dream, free from social norms and standards. To find this tale, one must not only meet the standards set by others, but also connect with their own inner direction. It can be hard for young guys to find and listen to their own voice in today's noisy world, where many people are telling them what they should be. You have to ask yourself, who am I besides what the world wants me to be? This inner trip, this looking within, is likely the most important step toward becoming a real adult. Because being mature isn't just about getting older or accomplishing things on the outside, it's also about knowing and respecting who you are. Accepting this personal tale means letting go of standards and making your own way. It's about realizing that success isn't judged by what other people think, but by how well your deeds match your truth. Which is great, each young man's story will be different. 
This tale is the light that guides them through the dark parts of life, whether they're trying to follow their purpose, make a change, or just be happy. Campbell said something very wise, and it's easy to see what it means. Facing the dragons isn't something to be afraid of, it's a way to grow. The real sign of being an adult isn't age or reaching certain goals, but having the guts to follow your own legend, even if it takes you in a different direction than what others have done. In the end, it's these one-of-a-kind trips and tales that add to the weave of humanity and give hope and inspiration to people who have yet to go on their own quests. It helps us understand the path that young guys are taking now if we look back in time. With their clear rules and ideals, ancient societies are very different from today's world, which is always changing. The Greeks and Romans are two of the most important old nations, both for the huge things they did and for how complex their society was. By looking into how they see being a guy and being responsible, we can better understand what adulthood is all about and the challenges that come with it. In ancient Greece, becoming a man wasn't just a matter of getting older. It was a big change that came with responsibilities, honor, and social roles. The Greeks didn't just think that a boy became a man when he reached puberty. They also thought about the boy's spiritual, mental, and social growth. The Aphia, an important event in Athens for boys, is a great example of this complicated change. Once the person turned 18, this practice wasn't just a ceremony. It was a long, hard process of training that included physical exercise, social duty, and spiritual reflection. During the Aphia, young men learned how to fight, how to run a government, and the deep philosophical ideas that Greece is known for. It was a changing trip that produced thinkers, leaders, and citizens, in addition to fighters. There was more to this process than just personal growth. It was a promise to society, a duty to serve and care for others. I and their world, a man's worth, was determined by his service to the city-state, as well as his own accomplishments. Their stories, like the brave Achilles and the wise Odysseus, and their dedication to society show this point of view. The Romans, receiving and building upon Greek customs, had their unique taste of manhood. In the center of Rome, the toga virilis was a sign of the change from boy to man. When a boy put on this toga of adulthood, which usually happened around age 16, it wasn't just a fashion choice, it was a deep change. With this change of clothes, he became more visible and ready to join the complicated dance of Roman politics, business, and society. Roman men were described by traits that came from the word via, which means man. I was the epitome of bravery, greatness, and valor. But alongside virtues, other virtues like gravitas, a sense of duty to the gods and family, and dignitas, a sense of personal worth, were bases upon which Roman men stood. These values were taught, tried, and polished through military service, public posts, and social activities. A Roman man's journey was one of constant growth, where every job, be it as a fighter, a senator, or a father, was a stepping stone to deeper knowledge and greater duty. The rites of passage and challenges these ancient young men faced were, in essence, societal crucibles. These traditions guaranteed that the young guys not only grew as people, but emerged as leaders of their communities. Whether it was defending their homeland, participating in civic duties, or simply upholding familial honor, their adulthood was a tapestry of personal and societal threads interwoven tightly. In contrast to our modern era, where the benchmarks of adulthood are increasingly individualistic and varied, the ancients had clear, structured milestones. But at their core, the challenges remain eerily similar. The quest for identity, the balance between personal desires and societal expectations, and the yearning for purpose are constants across time. In drawing parallels and contrasts with these ancient civilizations, 
we glean insights for our contemporary understanding of manhood. Perhaps the lesson is that while the markers of adulthood evolve, its essence remains immutable. It's a balance between self and society, between personal legend and communal duty. The rights may change, the challenges may wear different masks, but the journey, in its depth and complexity, remains a timeless human endeavor. As the sands of time have ebbed, the canvas of manhood has undergone considerable shifts, particularly evident in the realm of the modern age. Today's young men navigate a terrain starkly different from the structured labyrinths of ancient Greece and Rome. The societal crucibles once defined by clear rights and communal virtues are now overshadowed by multifaceted challenges birthed from rapid societal, economic and educational transformations. Foremost among these transformations is the paradigm shift in education. No longer is education a brief transitional phase, it's an elongated journey, often stretching well into the mid-twenties or even thirties for some. In ancient societies, by the time a man was in his early twenties, he had already shouldered significant responsibilities. Today, however, that same age might find a young man engrossed in tertiary education, grappling with the intricacies of specialized disciplines or navigating the demanding corridors of graduate schools. The consequence, a delayed plunge into the working world. This prolongation of academic life creates a ripple effect, postponing not just financial independence, but often other markers of adulthood, like marriage, home ownership, or even clarity of purpose. The economic landscape further compounds these delays. Unlike the agrarian or localized economies of yesteryears, today's globalized economy is both an avenue of boundless opportunities and a minefield of unpredictable challenges. Housing, once a straightforward milestone, is now a complex pursuit with skyrocketing real estate prices in urban hubs. The dream of owning a piece of land, a staple of the proverbial American dream, feels increasingly elusive for many. The job market too bears little resemblance to its predecessors. The linear careers of the past have fragmented into a mosaic of gig economies, temporary contracts, and a constant race to upskill in the face of automation and AI. Economic crises, be it the financial meltdown of 2008 or the uncertainties brought by the COVID-19 pandemic, have further exacerbated the challenges young men face in establishing themselves in the working world. The traditional paths to stability and success have become less predictable, making the journey to adulthood a precarious one. In the midst of these changes, the concept of masculinity itself is evolving. The traditional rigid notions of what it means to be a man are giving way to a more fluid understanding of gender roles and identities. Young men today grapple with questions of identity and masculinity in a way that previous generations may not have. Yet, amidst these challenges and transformations, the essence of manhood endures. It's still about responsibility, integrity, and the pursuit of one's unique path in life. The journey may be more complex, the milestones less clearly defined, but the quest for self-discovery, purpose and contribution to society remains at its core. As we navigate the ever-changing landscape of modern manhood, it's important to recognize that the challenges young men face are not just individual, but also societal. They reflect the broader shifts in our culture, economy and education systems. Understanding and supporting young men in their journey to adulthood requires a nuanced perspective that acknowledges both the timeless aspects of manhood and the evolving realities of the modern age. Or the pervasive ramifications of the COVID-19 pandemic cast long shadows on job security and financial stability. For a young man today, charting a course in this tumultuous economic sea requires more than diligence. It demands adaptability, resilience, and a penchant for lifelong learning. 
Parallel to these economic and educational tectonic shifts, the fabric of relationships, family and marriage has undergone profound transformation. The once sacrosanct institution of marriage, often an early milestone in a man's life, has seen its timeline pushed. With shifting societal priorities, many young men and women prioritize personal growth, career ambitions and individual pursuits before settling into marital commitments. The notion of family too is ever-evolving. Nuclear families, single-parent households, or even chosen families of close friends redefine what home means in the 21st century. Moreover, the dynamics of relationships have adapted to the digital age. In a world where love can spark across continents through screens and where relationships might begin or end with the swipe of a finger, the rules of engagement are continually being rewritten. These changes, while offering unprecedented freedom and choices, also bring forth new challenges. The paradox of choice, the quest for authentic connections in a digital age, and the balancing act between personal independence and shared responsibilities in partnerships. In this modern tableau, young men find themselves juggling an array of roles, expectations and challenges. Where the ancients had clear demarcated rites of passage, today's journey to adulthood is more fluid, less defined and often punctuated with a series of mini rites spanning decades. Yet beneath these complexities, the underlying quest remains unchanged. The search for identity, purpose and a rightful place in the societal mosaic. Navigating the complex waters of contemporary masculinity, a term frequently emerges encapsulating both a cultural archetype and a tangible reflection of our era, the Peter Pan syndrome. This term, much like its namesake from J.M. Barrie's timeless tale, embodies the reluctance to grow up. It paints a picture of individuals trapped in the buoyant bliss of childhood, feet afloat, eyes averse to the shores of adulthood. But is it a mere metaphor, or does it find roots in deeper psychological underpinnings? Let's embark on a journey through its facets, origins, and implications. The Peter Pan syndrome at its core can be characterized by a profound resistance to the responsibilities of adult life. Individuals grappling with this condition often showcase a palpable fear of commitment, whether in relationships, careers, or personal goals. Their lives, rather than charting a definitive trajectory, seem to meander through a labyrinth of short-lived passions, fleeting relationships, and evasive responsibilities. The allure of the now overshadows the promises and perils of the tomorrow. An insatiable quest for pleasure instant gratification and an aversion to enduring hardships often punctuate their daily choices. Yet, while these attributes paint a vivid portrait, one must tread carefully. Is the Peter Pan syndrome a genuine clinical condition or is it more of a societal construct? In the clinical realm, while it isn't recognized as a standalone disorder in major diagnostic manuals, Certain traits associated with it mirror those found in conditions like avoidant personality disorder or certain types of narcissistic personality disorder. These overlapping characteristics include difficulty committing, avoiding responsibility, or seeking constant validation. Yet, it's crucial to distinguish between genuine clinical conditions and behavior patterns influenced by societal and cultural factors. Labeling the latter as pathological can risk oversimplifying and stigmatizing complex behavioral phenomena. Delving into the coal pathways, multiple threads emerge, weaving a tapestry both intricate and intriguing. One significant strand is the rise of overprotective parenting. The helicopter parent, always hovering, shielding their progeny from life's bumps and scrapes. This can inadvertently foster a sense of invulnerability in their children. When challenges arise, these individuals, cocooned for years, find themselves ill-equipped to tackle them, leading to avoidance and escapism. 
Societal changes, as elucidated in our discussion on modern shifts, further compound this. The era of abundant choice, while empowering, can also lead to decision paralysis. When every door is open, stepping through one becomes daunting. The fear of missing out, a distinctly modern malaise, can trap individuals in a perpetual state of indecision, further fueling their Peter Pan tendencies. Inherent personality traits too play their part. Just as some are natural-born leaders or innately curious, others might lean towards comfort, risk aversion, or a heightened need for immediate gratification. While societal constructs or parenting styles can amplify these tendencies, they often have deep-seated roots in an individual's personal matrix. In our exploration of the Peter Pan syndrome, we unearth its layered nuances, origins, and intersections with both personal and societal dynamics. As we step back and view the broader canvas, we understand that it's not just an isolated phenomenon, but a reflection of the evolving nature of adulthood and societal expectations. Addressing it, therefore, is not a matter of mere diagnosis, but a call for societal introspection, understanding, and empathy. As we continue our journey into the psyche of modern manhood, it's essential to approach such phenomena with both critical thought and an open heart, fostering an environment where growth is both encouraged and nurtured. Amidst the myriad analyses of young men's inertia towards adulthood, it becomes essential to step into the domain where questions of existence, meaning and identity hold sway. Philosophy, existentialism, a philosophical movement rooted in understanding individual existence and freedom, presents a compelling lens through which to view this conundrum. At its heart lies a concept that resonates deeply with the challenges of modern manhood, authenticity. Existential authenticity is not just a mere understanding of oneself, it's about embracing one's freedom and the associated responsibilities. It's the acknowledgement that our existence is not predetermined, that we have the freedom to shape our destiny, and that in this freedom lies both our greatest strength and our deepest vulnerabilities. To be authentic is to be true to oneself, even when faced with life's inherent absurdities and the weight of external expectations. The theater of existentialism finds one of its most brilliant playwrights in Jean-Paul Sartre. For Sartre, the world is a stage where humans are condemned to be free. This freedom, boundless and intimidating, brings with it the anguish of choice. Yet it is within this freedom that the pitfalls of bad faith lurk. Bad faith is a form of self-deception. It's the act of lying to oneself, of evading the truth of one's freedom and the responsibilities it entails. When one lives in bad faith, they adopt false values, embrace societal roles without question, and avoid the sheer responsibility of carving their path. Let's relate this to the hesitation, the fears of commitment, and the shirking of responsibilities often seen in young men today. Could it be that many are living in bad faith, veering away from the intimidating vastness of their freedom? The social models of success, relationships, and men might seem enticing because they offer a sense of order in an otherwise chaotic existence. Adhering to these models without reflection is a sign of bad trust. It's similar to wearing a mask, a costume that masks the frightening freedom beneath. The fear of commitment, the draw of the fleeting, and the avoidance of duty can all be seen as efforts to escape the weight of this freedom. After all, to pledge, to decide, to accept duty is to face one's freedom head on. It's to shape the clay of life with one's own hands, even at the risk of making it incorrectly. Existentialism, with its stress on individual freedom and authenticity, calls one to cast away the chains of bad faith and accept the freeing, albeit challenging, truth of one's existence. It's a ringing call to young guys, asking them to shed social masks, 
to face their fears and to shape their fate with the tool of authenticity. In this intellectual study, existentialism crosses the gap between old knowledge and current problems. Through Sartre's view, the problems faced by young guys are not just personal or social, but deeply philosophical. The road to adulthood, then, is not just about social milestones. It's about accepting one's freedom, facing life's inherent flaws, and finding a path lit by authenticity. Media is definitely one of the most powerful creators of societal trends. Films, TV shows, and larger pop culture tales seep into the common mind, quietly molding views and expectations. Within this vast weave of tales lies a dual story. On one hand, the archetypical hero's journey, a trip of obstacles, growth, and ultimate victory. On the other, a developing story of continuous childhood, where the trials of growth are swapped for the charm of endless youth. Let's dig into this dichotomy, studying how media's image of men can either inspire ambitions or entrench selfish habits. The hero's journey, as described by Joseph Campbell, can be observed in countless film epics and literary classics. Whether it's Luke Skywalker crossing planets or Frodo Baggins traveling through Middle Earth, these characters illustrate the classic path from youth through trials to successful self-realization. Their tales are marked by change, an arc that connects deeply with our natural thirst for growth and meaning. Yet, side by side with these famous stories, modern media has created a contrasting type of male characters. Not the heroes who face monsters, but the endless teenagers stuck in a timeless standstill. Shows like The Big Bang Theory or movies like The 40-Year-Old Virgin present characters who, while charming, are often caught in eternal youth. Their obstacles are not huge dragons, but everyday issues. Their successes lie not in radical growth, but in small, often comic evolutions. The pendulum, it seems, has moved from active heroes facing external obstacles to more quiet viewers managing internal quandaries. There's something appealing about the rise of the endless teen trope. It's fun to watch characters navigate a world where nothing is at stake where every mistake can be fixed, and where every day offers the joy of being a boy. But that's what makes escape so appealing. If stories about great deeds make us want to be better people, then stories about long-lasting youth protect us from the harsh realities of life. For many young guys, this image can be a comforting balm that makes putting off dealing with life's problems seem okay. The silly tales of Peter Pans on TV and in movies can make real-life goals seem less important. The very nature of modern entertainment, with its vast video game worlds, binge-worthy shows, and virtual realities, entices one to escape the real world. When virtual successes, like beating game levels or making your digital self perfect, give you instant satisfaction, the slow and often hard work of real-world wins can seem less appealing. But it's important to understand that the media isn't a single entity that forces stories on people. It's more like a mirror that shows how people's values, fears, and hopes are changing. The idea of always being a teenager can be seen as both suffocating and a comment on how complicated modern society is. It talks about the many problems adults face today, from money problems to spiritual questions. As much as the media shapes the passive viewer stuck in childhood, society changes shape him too. I find that media serves as both a guide and a guardian as I make my way through the maze that is modern manhood. Stories about heroes can make people want to do great things, but stories about endless youth can either make people feel better or keep them from moving forward. Then it's up to the smart watcher to get ideas from stories that change lives and to see long youth not as a goal, but as a powerful reflection on our times. In this dance of stories, it's important to remember that every story, no matter how escape-oriented, has truths that reflect the world it comes from. 
One important part of human growth is having guide lights or people who show others the way because of their knowledge, experiences and strong character. Mentors and role models are very important in forming people's goals, ideals and paths, whether they're in sports, school or the complicated world of personal growth. During the difficult trip from being a boy to a man, when there are many questions, difficulties and unknowns, this becomes especially clear. In its long history, there are many people who not only excelled in their fields, but also had deep insights into how to live a good life. Take the Stoic philosopher and politician Seneca as an example. His political skills were important, but it's his intellectual thoughts that have been remembered for thousands of years. In his writings to Lucilius, Seneca talks about what it means to be a man, focusing on traits like strength, moderation, and clarity of purpose. Seneca wrote, Life is very short and anxious for those who forget the past, neglect the present, and fear the future. This isn't just a philosophical saying. Seneca is giving young men a roadmap, telling them to live in the present with passion and purpose, without worrying about the past or the future. In a similar spirit, the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius wrote Meditations, a personal diary that captures the core of Stoic thought. Marcus was an emperor, but he was also a guide in the written word. He helped many people through the rough spots in life. Waste no more time arguing what a good man should be. Be one, he wrote, giving young men a clear call to action that encourages them to live by values rather than just talk about them. He stressed virtues like humility, acceptance and duty. The fact that these historical figures were so wise doesn't just show how smart they were. It also shows how much people valued having a guide. Philosophers in the past were not isolated thinkers who lived in high towers. Instead, they were active members of society who helped guide young people, teach social ideals and train future leaders. Whether it was through official training or casual advice, the idea of a guide was ingrained in society. Things have changed since then, and the surface now looks a little different. With all of today's amazing technology advances and quick social changes, young guys have access to a lot of knowledge, but they often lack the understanding that comes from having a personal guide for a long time. There are so many views online that it can be hard to hear the careful, patient advice that teachers use to give. The rise of short-lived celebrities could overshadow the timeless advice of real role models. Even with all of this change, the desire for real direction is stronger than ever. People are becoming more aware of how important strong leaders are in today's broken society. For young people, community leaders, teachers, coaches, and even virtual guides through online sites are becoming very important. These teachers don't just give help, they also share their own experiences, lessons learned from mistakes, and a sensitive understanding of the specific problems young people today face. As a link between young men and the timeless ideals of the past, they give them the tools they need to deal with the difficulties of the present. It's impossible to say enough about how important teachers and role models are whether they come from past or modern life. They show young guys the way through the rough waves of youth and into the wide seas of adulthood. Young guys find not only the right answers, but also the right questions, as well as direction and purpose, thanks to their knowledge, patience and experiences. As society changes, it will be very important to bring back the practice of mentoring, make it fit with modern life and put an emphasis on real advice for forming the men of tomorrow. Moving from the soft stage of childhood to the rough land of adulthood is not something that can be done alone. It requires a helpful environment where the person is always given tools, advice and signs that show progress. I've noticed that young guys are taking longer to become adults so it's important to talk about practical answers that can help them grow up. 
While these answers are deeply rooted in custom and are part of everyday life, they need to be brought back to life and changed to fit the needs of today. Community is where growth happens. The saying, it takes a village to raise a child, is not just a nice saying, it's a deep truth. In the past, groups were like safety nets that made sure their young were cared for, taught and accepted into society. Within the community, young men could find a wide range of role models, from the wise adult who taught them about life to the skilled craftsman who taught them a job. They lived in an environment that constantly emphasized the values, rules and standards of society. The idea of community has changed over time as cities have grown and technology has improved. There is a risk of atomization, which is when people feel alone even though they are very linked online. We need to rebuild these neighborhood ties right away to help young guys become adults. This could look like training programs, community projects in the area, or group activities that help build leadership, teamwork, and a feeling of belonging. We set the stage for the overall growth of young guys by putting them in situations where they can watch, connect with, and learn from a wide range of people. Challenges that are planned. This idea of testing young people as a rite of passage into adulthood has been around for a long time and in many countries. Whether it's the Spartan Agoge, where young boys were trained hard to become fighters, or the Native American vision hunts, organized tasks have always been an important part of marking the change from being a boy to a man. The nature of these problems needs to be rethought in light of current circumstances. The focus can be on intellectual, mental and moral problems rather than physical obstacles. Structured programs that get young guys out of their safe zones, like hikes in the woods, volunteer work in places they've never been before, or intellectual arguments, can be very good for their growth. Dealing with and getting through these problems not only makes you stronger, but it also gives you a sense of success and self-worth which are important factors for becoming an adult. Rites of passage. Ceremonies have always been a part of human societies to mark important changes in life. These rites of passage are more than just traditional practices. They help people mentally and socially make the change from one stage of life to the next. For young guys, these ceremonies can be a big part of recognizing and enjoying their becoming adults. Creating new rites of passage is one way that modern society can be creative. This could include celebrations to mark important events like graduating, starting a new job, or finishing a community project successfully. By officially praising these accomplishments, young men are given clear signs of how far they've come and how mature they are becoming. Philosophy as a Guide because philosophers think deeply about themselves, they have often come up with answers to important philosophical questions and set rules that apply to all time and space. Philosophy not only gives young guys comfort, but it also gives them useful advice for dealing with the problems that come with becoming adults in a world that changes quickly. This knowledge is based on three main ideas, taking responsibility, looking for personal meaning, and living in an honest way. As a boy grows into a man, one of the most important changes is realizing and accepting your own duty. Philosophers from ancient Rome's Stoics to modern existentialists like Jean-Paul Sartre have stressed how important it is to take responsibility for one's actions. Stoicism, which stresses ethics and self-control, helps young guys learn to tell the difference between things they can manage and things they can't. Epictetus said, men are disturbed not by things, but by the views which they take of them. Young men can develop a sense of agency by focusing on their area of influence and taking responsibility for their actions and responses. This will give them a sense of self-reliance and purpose as adults. With his existentialist view, Sartre went one step further and said that people are doomed to be free. 
young guys who have this freedom also have full duty for it. This means they understand that the choices they make affect their essence and that they are in charge of their own fate. That awareness can be scary at first, but once they accept it, it guides them toward purpose-driven, focused lives, looking for personal meaning in a world full of information, opportunities, and distractions. Finding personal meaning can be like figuring out how to get through a maze. Philosophers, on the other hand, shine a light. Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust victim and the creator of Logotherapy, said that the primary human drive is not happiness, as Freud said, but the search for meaning. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is more than just a book. It's a story about how strong people are. It teaches young guys a very important lesson. Meaning is not something you idly receive. It's something you actively make, whether it's through work, relationships, tasks, or artistic projects. Young guys need to find their own way and make sure that their deeds are in line with their own morals and goals. This kind of search for meaning gives people purpose, changing the confusion of youth into the clarity of adults and the ability to live honestly. Existentialists have a psychological idea called authenticity that says people should live in line with their true selves and not let outside forces or social norms change them. Bad faith, which Sartre defined as lying to oneself and denying their freedom and duty, can be stopped by being authentic. For young guys, living truly means taking off the masks that society gives them, questioning the views they were raised with and making a road that feels right to them. It means facing the worries of freedom, the weight of duty, and the difficulties of being themselves while coming out on the other side with a life that is truly theirs. It's a call to guide young guys toward adulthood by being active players in their story rather than silent spectators. Philosophy is hard, but it can help young guys find a way to get where they want to go. By taking on duty, young guys build the basis for a life with meaning. By looking for personal value, they make their life fit with their goals. By being themselves, they make sure that this life, with all of its ups and downs, stays true to who they are. The young guys who go on this intellectual trip learn not only about the challenges of becoming an adult, but also about the deep joy of living a good life. We've looked into a lot of different areas, both in terms of history and ideas, ranging from the basics of how social landscapes change to the deepest parts of psychological thought. We've looked into the complicated issue of why some young guys don't become adults until later in life, combining ideas from different fields to better understand it and, more importantly, come up with ways to fix it. The journey from being a boy to becoming a man is as old as people are. Every time period has its own problems, but the trip itself stays the same. It's a journey of self-discovery, growth, and taking responsibility. The ancient Greeks knew how important rites of passage were because they were very good at training their bodies and minds. Philosophers like Sartre and Frankl told us to look for purpose and realness. With all the things we have today, the need for advice, thought, and mentoring has only grown. However, our conversation can teach more than just young people. No matter how old we are, we are all always on the verge of becoming adults again. The stages of life don't end. They change as we get older, deal with problems, take on new tasks, and adjust to new situations. Another level of growth to reach and another level of understanding to discover is always there. Real growth happens when you look back on your own story, which includes wins, mistakes, joys, and difficulties. This is true for every watcher and every person. The problems young men today may seem hard to solve, but experience and the fact that people are strong show that we can change, learn, and do well. We can help the next generation and ourselves through the complicated dance of growing up by using the knowledge of the past 
as a foundation and the insights of the present as a direction. Every age brings new problems and new stars, thinkers, leaders and creators. With the knowledge of the past and the energy of the present, they create new paths in the music of life. Being a kid is just one action. It has beautiful tunes and sad crescendos. It's a movement that calls for focus, reflection and action on our part. Let this exploration's end be the start of something new for all of our viewers. A time to think, an opportunity to understand and a fresh start on the path to becoming an adult. After all, becoming an adult isn't just about getting older, it's also about getting wiser, having more experience and really growing. Let's remember that every sunset is the start of a new day, every struggle is a chance to grow and every generation, even if it seems lost at first, finds its way and moves forward with ease, knowledge and lasting adulthood. Imagine a world where success wasn't based on awards, accomplishments and major turning points. A world where the search for the next big thing didn't overshadow the trip. What if what success really means was very different from what society has taught us? Join us as we reveal a point of view that could change the way you think about success and, by extension, your whole life. We talked about things that make us think, question our views, and dig at the very core of our being in the broad fields of philosophy and psychology. This channel has always been a safe place for people who want to learn more about everything from the complexities of human behavior to the existential questions of purpose. And today, as always, we'll start another interesting journey. For many of us, the badges of respect that society gives to certain accomplishments are what make us feel successful. It's easy to think that success is about getting to the top of the business ladder, holding expensive things, or even having brief moments of fame on social media. But what if success isn't about these things, but about the journey? What if it's about how you find your way, the goals you set, and the ideas you strive for? This brings us to the main point of our conversation, a quote that says something so deep but so easy. Great Earl Nightingale, who was known for digging deep into people's minds and what drives them, once said, success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. At first glance, this may look like just another motivational quote that we might see on Instagram next to a beautiful sunrise. But, like many deep facts, its simplicity isn't what it seems. Nightingale gives us a viewpoint where success is the trip itself, as opposed to success as a location that we arrive at after overcoming difficulties. Every time you take a step towards something you think is important, every time you're in line with your goals, and every day you wake up with purpose, passion and determination are all examples of what I mean. But what's new about this point of view, and why does it mean more now than ever? In the world we live in now, things change quickly, and old standards of success are changing or falling apart completely. Even though things like a house, a car and the corner office are still valuable, younger generations are looking for something more real. They want to find meaning, happiness and a place to join in a world that is both very connected and very isolated. Additionally, the fast-paced nature of the digital age and the constant need to compare ourselves to others can make people feel constantly weak. Success moves the goalposts all the time. Just as you reach one, a new one pops up on the horizon, often leaving you feeling empty. Though, what if the road to the goal, not the goal itself, was what made you happy? Nightingale's point of view gives us a break from this never-ending quest. It gives you a chance to stop, think and get back on track. It talks about a greater need that all people have, the need for meaning, growth and a path that counts. As we talk about this subject today, I want you to join us on this trip to question, think about and maybe change how you think about success. This is more than just a saying. It's a way of thinking, living 
and seeing the world that can make it better. Come with me as we break down this deep statement, look at its philosophical and psychological roots, and see how it can help us find our way through the often confusing path of modern life. Now let's talk about what culture tells us is the key to success. When you go into any shop, the shelves are full of self-help books that promise you will be successful. Most of the time, these push for a simple path. Do well in school, get a good job, get promoted, buy a house, get married, and so on. It sounds like the motto is, get more, do more, and you will be more. A lot of the time, material wealth is seen as the most obvious sign of success. We live in a society that looks up to billionaires and values having a lot of money. In some ways, financial wealth has even been voted as the most important thing in life. After all, doesn't money give us the freedom and chances we so desperately want? But let us take a moment to think. Does having a lot of money promise happiness? What's more, does it really mean success in a broad sense? Even Nightingale would say that it doesn't, especially if getting rich isn't in line with what you really think is a good thing. Getting into exclusive places, having famous links, having a lot of followers on social media, and having your peers admire, if not envy, you are the next thing on the list. People often see these as signs of a good life. People have cared about their social standing and the approval of others for thousands of years. In order to stay alive, our ancestors needed to be able to get along with others. But today, this basic need has been taken to heights that can be confusing. The never-ending quest for fame can turn into a Sisyphean job, where no matter how hard we try, the rock of social expectations keeps rolling back. Career achievement, such as titles, raises, and awards, is another shiny symbol of normal success. In the usual path to success, these are the important stops along the way. We've all heard stories about people who went from being poor to becoming rich through hard work and drive. These stories can give you ideas, but they also show you things in a narrow way. People who only think about their careers as successful often forget about other parts of their lives, like their health, their families, and their benefits to society as a whole. So what's wrong with these definitions? They aren't universal, for starts. What one person sees as a big step towards success might not mean anything at all to someone else. Not only does this one-size-fits-all method lack subtlety, it can also be damaging. Imagine a young adult who, despite having a successful job, feels a strange void because they chose a field based on its potential for making them money instead of one that aligns with their interests. Think about the businessman who gets rich but loses important relationships with family and friends. Imagine a social media star who, despite having a lot of likes and fans, struggles with anxiety and loneliness behind the scenes. The effects reach into the area of mental health. In 2019, the Journal of Abnormal Psychology released a study that found more and more young people in the US are depressed and having mental health problems. There are many reasons for this rising tide, but one that can't be ignored is the stress and worry that come from what society thinks success should be like. Constantly chasing a fantasy made by societal rules can lead to a gap between reality and expectation, which can be a good environment for mental health problems like sadness and anxiety. In some cases, pursuing these traditional success marks can result in burnout, which is a condition of emotional, physical and mental tiredness brought on by prolonged stress. It shouldn't be a surprise that health groups are becoming more and more aware of burnout as a real medical issue. A lot of people don't know what success is, so they don't know where to look for it. If you really think about it, success is just working toward a good goal. This means a successful person knows what they're doing and where they want to go. A great person has a goal that they are working toward. In other words, the high school or college boy working toward a diploma is just as good as any other person on earth because he knows what he's doing, 
why he's getting up in the morning and where he's going. On the other hand, someone is said to be unsuccessful if they don't know what they're working toward or what they want. So, if this is the case, why isn't everyone successful? It should be easy, but polls show that at least 19 out of 20 people aren't. In fact, a poll of thousands of working guys found that 19 out of 20 didn't know why they got up in the morning and went to work. There were 19 people out of 20 who worked who had no idea why they got up in the morning and went to work. When they were asked about it, they said, well, everyone works. That sounds like a good reason to quit. In fact, here's a general rule you might want to remember. No matter what the vast majority is doing, if you do the exact opposite, you'll almost certainly never make another mistake in your life. Just something to think about. First, we talked about common ways to measure success. This set the stage for Earl Nightingale's new ideas. We show the weak spots in a social construct that many people have accepted without question. This lets us start looking into other theories and ways of thinking that can not only make our lives more balanced, but also deeply satisfying. Getting closer to a good goal over time becomes a useful life philosophy at this point. It gives us a model of success that is both classic and in many ways new. Let's move away from the narrow definitions of traditional success and look into the psychological models that give us a more complete picture of what success really means. After all, psychology isn't just the study of illness or disorder, it's also the study of what makes life worth living, which includes success in any sense. First, let's look at Abraham Maslow's list of wants. Imagine a tower with different levels. The base would be basic needs like food and housing, and the top would be self-actualization, which means reaching your full potential and knowing what you're capable of. Maslow's theory says that we can't think about bigger goals until our basic wants are met. As soon as they are met, we can work on self-esteem wants like respect and success, and then we can aim for self-actualization. Don't you think Maslow's apex sounds a lot like what Nightingale called a worthy ideal? Both say that reaching our fullest ability is what makes us truly successful. Importantly, Maslow presents the notion that, based on the level of the hierarchy we are trying to achieve, what we consider to be a good goal may change at different times of our lives. This idea frees us from a fixed, one-size-fits-all idea of what success is. Let's talk about drive next, which is an area of psychology that has changed a lot in the last few decades. Traditional views often focus on secondary motivation, which is motivated by benefits or punishments from outside sources. These awards, which can be anything from money to social praise, are what most people think of as success. In psychology, however, there has been a change in the focus toward the value of innate motivation, which is motivation that comes from within and isn't based on benefits from outside sources. Think of a painter who gets lost in the world of colors and shapes, a singer who gets lost in the world of sounds, or even a researcher who is just naturally interested in things. They want to do it because they enjoy it, and when they succeed, it makes them feel good. This brings us back to what Nightingale said. The idea of internal drive fits perfectly with the idea of success as the gradual realization of a good ideal. Success, in my opinion, is defined by internal satisfaction rather than outward benefits. Here, being self-motivated does more than just make us happy. Researchers have found that it improves health, efficiency and persistence. Think about the story of J.K. Rowling, who had many rejects and hard times before her Harry Potter books were published. What made her keep going? It wasn't the promise of fame or money in the future that drove her. It was her own desire to tell a story she believed in. After all these years, it's clear that her noble goal wasn't just to write a book. It was to make a world that millions of people could relate to. In this case, 
both internal drive and the good ideal come together to make a lovely picture of what success might look like. What does it win for the world to shift its attention from external to internal drivers of motivation? Imagine if companies valued their workers for more than just how much they produced. Instead of defining information, educational methods that help each person grow should be used for people to be valued for who they are instead of what they have. This isn't just wishful thinking. It's a model backed by decades of study in psychology. The psychology of well-being is always present when we talk about the psychology of success. They're like two sides of the same coin. Studies have shown that internal drive not only helps people do better in their jobs, but it also helps their mental health. At this point, Psychology gives Nightingale's idea of what success means scientific weight. As we go through these psychology theories, we'll see that they not only shed light on Nightingale's ideas, but they also back them up. His description encourages us to think about success in a way that is whole, satisfying, and most importantly, unique to each person. This kind of success should feed the mind as well as the desire. And isn't that what we're all after in the end? Whenever you start to doubt your path or feel limited by society's limited ideas of success, remember this. Success isn't just about getting where you want to go. It's also about enjoying the trip, especially if it helps you reach an important goal. We're leaving psychology behind and going into the deep seas of philosophy to see success from a different point of view. Philosophy and its many theories give us not only knowledge, but also a sense of history. It's like seeing a picture of how people have thought about what makes a life great or good. For starters, let's go back in time to ancient Greece. Philosophers such as Socrates, Plato and Aristotle thought a lot about what it means to live a happy life or eudaimonia, which is often translated as happiness or flourishing. Aristotle thought that eudaimonia was closely connected to virtue and thoughtful reflection. He also thought that a life spent seeking knowledge, practicing virtue and building character was a life well lived. There are a lot of striking similarities between this and Nightingale's good ideal. Aristotle thought that a good character and the sensible activity that came from it, the goal itself, were the most important things in life. The good life was made up of doing things that were good and wise. In this case, there was no end point. There was only a constant trying, or to use Nightingale's words, a gradual awareness. This is also true of Stoicism, a theory that came from Greece but was widely accepted in Rome thanks to the work of Seneca, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. The Stoics thought that the key to success was to find inner peace by controlling one's wants and feelings. Stoicism tells us to pay attention to what we can change, our actions and attitudes, rather than what is happening in the outside world. This freedom in one's inner life fits with Nightingale's idea of taking responsibility for reaching a good goal. As we move forward to more current times, existentialism gives us another fascinating way to look at success. Existentialist thinkers, such as Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, said that life doesn't have a meaning of its own, Instead, each person must make their own soul by the choices and acts they make. To put it another way, you are in charge of the objectives you set and the noble causes you fight for. This way of thinking forces us to face both our freedoms and the responsibilities that come with them. We are free to choose our own worthwhile ideal and, by extension, our own version of success. But this freedom also means that we have to live with the decisions we make. We can't depend on changing societal standards or short-lived trends to give our lives direction. This is a beautiful connection to Nightingale's claim that success is the quest of a personally defined good standard. Philosophy isn't just something that people in the West do, let's not forget that. Buddhism, Taoism and the Hindu idea of Dharma 
are all Eastern beliefs that try to figure out what makes a life worthwhile. A lot of these beliefs are based on the idea of balance, unity, and being linked to everything else. This makes our study even more complicated. These traditions talk about good things that can happen in life, like going beyond oneself, others, or even the material world. They also give different ways to live a good life. So why get into theory when talking about something that seems very useful, like success? Because it lets us take a step back and think about bigger issues. How should you live your life? What should people try to achieve? First, what does a good or happy life look like? It's important to remember that the idea of success, ESS, comes from deep psychological thought. Throughout history, different thinkers have offered different but still useful ways to live a happy life. It's important to realize that these ideas don't contradict each other. They can live together and even help each other to better understand what success is. So, the virtuous life of Aristotle, the stoic focus on inner peace, and the philosophical freedom of making our own meaning are all different but important parts of the whole. Like Nightingale, they all seem to be saying the same thing. Success is not a place you get to. It's a trip you take to reach a good goal. After swimming through the seas of psychology and hiking through the mountains of philosophy, let's look straight at the worthwhile ideal, which is at the heart of Nightingale's meaning. This word seems to have a clear meaning, but it's like an onion. The more you peel it back, the more layers you can see. We know that he usually works 40 hours a week. That's 72 hours a week when he's not working or sleeping. He has 72 hours a week that he can spend however he wants. His little house and car are his, and he's married at this point. This is what he does with his 72 hours of free time every week. He's going to do the same thing that other guys do with their weekly 72 hours off, which is almost nothing. Every day, he'll quit right away, get in his little car, drive to his little house, go into his little kitchen, kiss his little wife, and say, I'm tired. They even know why he says that. They think he learned it from hearing his father say it when men used to get tired working during the day, and he says it every night when he gets home. He quickly eats his small meal and then goes to the living room to turn on his escape box. He sits there for six and a half hours until his wife, who is a bit more practical than he is, taps him on the shoulder and says, Charlie, I think it's about time you went to bed. You have to get up in the morning and go to work. He's fine, so he turns it off. He knows how to do that. He just turns it off and goes to sleep. The next morning, he does it all over again. For 40 years, he has done this every day. After 40 years, he retires, which surprises him every time. No one else has ever guessed that either. If things keep going the way they are, he will die at 85 or 90 years old. Because they're tired, what's the matter? Is this a tragedy? If that's how Charlie wants to live his life, then no problem. It's up to our made-up young man to decide how he wants to live his life. He lives in a free society where he can do what he wants. But if he's living that way because he hasn't made a choice, it's a terrible tragedy. If he's still doing what he did in first and second grade, which is hanging out with the guys down the block because they think they know how to live, then there's a real tragedy there because they've never known how to live, not in all of human history. Not only does he never discover who he is, but he also never fully explores his skills and abilities. He never learns that he has the power to create his own luck and have almost anything he desires. This is a shame. First, let's talk about the huge culture settings that shape our ideas of what a good goal might be. Think about the American dream, which is a big part of American society. In the US, life, liberty, and the quest of happiness are cherished values. In this case, a good goal often shows up as freedom, financial protection, and moving up in society. Now, compare this to a cooperative society like Japan, where wa, or social unity, is very important. In this case, a good goal might be to help society and keep things in balance, 
even if it means giving up personal goals or wants. In places like parts of India or Tibet, where spirituality is very important, a good goal might be spiritual growth and the well-being of the group rather than personal wealth. With its own past, beliefs and social structures, each society shapes what its people may think is a good ideal. But culture isn't the only thing that matters. Each of us has our own unique set of events, opinions and ideals. What one person thinks is a good goal might not be as important to someone else. For musicians, the worthwhile goal might be writing a new piece that moves people, and for environmental activists, it might be effectively promoting climate change. Ideals that are good can change. Our ideas about what is important can and often do change as we learn and grow. A business person who once found success by growing a company might later find a new worthwhile goal in helping others or teaching the next generation. Now, why is it so important to define a good ideal? Anyway, the goals you have for your life determine how it will go. Think of them as the North Star that guides your choices, actions and goals. When your personal ideals and long-term life goals are in line with each other, what you do makes sense and has a purpose. This connection isn't just vague or spiritual, it has real-world effects. Studies have shown that having your personal values and life goals in line with each other can make you happier and even help you deal with stress and the expected setbacks that come with life. This connection also makes sure that your forces are directed correctly. Every action you take brings you closer to your worthwhile standard, which gives your life more meaning and satisfaction. What happens when things aren't lined up right, though? There is a feeling of conflict, also called cognitive dissonance. It's like pushing really hard, but still not being able to get a square peg into a round hole. This disagreement can make you unhappy, stressed, and even feel like you've failed, even if you're doing other things that show you're successful. Remember that your worthwhile ideal doesn't have to be big or widely recognized. It just needs to be important to you as you set out on your journey to find or re-evaluate it. Ideally, it should be based on a set of values that you respect and should be in line with your core beliefs and goals. After all, as Nightingale said, a good ideal is personal. It guides you through the sea of life's options. In the big picture of life, knowing and working toward your worthwhile goal is not just a way to feel good about yourself. It's a bold way to define yourself. It's about making your own way in a world that wants to hand you a plan all the time. And it's this brave step that turns the search for success into a full, complex, and deeply rewarding trip. Now that we have a better understanding of what a good goal is, let us look at the other important part of Nightingale's success formula, the increasing realization. What use is a map if you're not going to move? Setting a goal isn't enough to be successful. You have to keep working toward that standard and grow along the way. In many ways, growth is what makes success possible. Let's look into why this is. I find that the most respected people in many areas of life, business, science, art and personal growth, are often those who are constantly honing their skills. Think about athletes who break records, musicians who change the way music is made, or scientists who find new things that are completely new. They all have one thing in common. They are always trying to get better. This never-ending effort is what Nightingale meant by progressive realization. Continuous growth isn't just about huge, life-changing steps. It's also about small, steady changes that add up over time. The Japanese idea of Kaizen, which stresses the importance of small, steady gains over time, often sums this up. Small steps forward like these add up and create a growing effect that causes big growth and finally, success. One of the three basic psychological needs recognized by self-determination theory is the need for competence, 
which growth fulfills in psychological terms. Feeling like you're making progress toward your goals feeds our natural drive, which makes us want to do more of what we're doing. There is a positive feedback loop where success leads to inspiration, which leads to more progress. As well, success is a measuring test that lets us know if our worthwhile goal is true and attainable. Even when we mean well, we sometimes pick ideals that aren't right for our skills or situations. If we don't make progress, that's feedback telling us that we need to change or improve our goals. This way, we can make sure that our ideas stay not only good, but also realistic and doable. It would be almost wrong not to talk about the important work of psychologist Carol Dweck at this point, especially her idea of the growth mindset. Dweck says that a fixed mindset means that a person thinks their abilities are fixed, while a growth mindset means that a person thinks their abilities can be changed and improved with hard work. The growth mindset is more than just a way of thinking. It's a way of life that changes how we deal with problems, setbacks, and eventually, our good intentions. If you want to be successful, having a growth attitude is like planting seeds of progress in rich dirt. By seeing difficulties as chances to learn and effort as the road to success, I support perseverance, promote creativity, and lessen fear of failing. If someone has a growth attitude, they are much more likely to work toward a worthwhile goal over time. A growth attitude is implied in Nightingale's idea, which is what makes it so beautiful. The acceptable ideal points you in the right direction, and the progressive understanding gives you the mindset and method you need to make the trip. Together, they make a balanced equation. The ideal is the why, and the increasing achievement is the how. If you want to really work toward a good ideal, you need to love the process as well as the result. Progress is no longer just a way to get somewhere else. It's a satisfying goal in and of itself. When every day, every job and every struggle turns into a step closer to your goal, you are not only successful, you are deeply and deeply involved in the process of living happily. In this way, every moment is a win, every effort is a success, and every failure is a lesson. Now that we've talked about the ideas behind Nightingale's deep observation, let's look at how it was used in real life. After all, it's interesting to learn about the thought and psychology behind success, but it's actually following these rules that will make your worthwhile ideal come true. The things we get in return for our work will always be proportional to what we do. We all know this because it's something we teach our kids in Sunday school. What you sow is what you will reap. We forget that it's true though. If a man is dissatisfied with his benefits, he only needs to find ways to do more to help others. It's like the story of the preacher who was traveling through the country when all of a sudden he saw the most beautiful farm he had ever seen. It looked lovely. So, he saw the farmer coming up the road on his tractor and greeted him. My good man, he said, God has certainly blessed you with a magnificent farm. The farmer thought for a moment and then said, Yes, you're right. He certainly has, but you should have seen this place when he had it all to himself. The preacher planned his sermon for the following Sunday. He saw that the land that all the farms along that road had been given was the same, but one man had done great things with it. We all have the same land. We all have a human life. We can all use it to make something great if we want to. This part will talk about specific steps you can take to set goals, make plans, and keep track of your progress. It will also talk about why traits like resilience and adaptability are so important on your trip. For starters, having goals shouldn't just mean writing down vague and undefined hopes. Smart goals are clear, measurable, attainable, relevant, and have a due date. Specificity gives you a clear picture of what you want to achieve. Measurability lets you keep track of your progress. Attainability keeps you grounded in reality. Relevance makes sure you stay in line with your good ideal. 
and a time frame gives you a sense of urgency. It's these smart goals that will help you get to your dream every step of the way. If your worthwhile goal is to help with medical research, a smart goal could be to write and publish a study report in a peer-reviewed magazine within the next two years about a new treatment that works. This goal is clear, measured, attainable, related to your good ideal and has a due date. It's time to plan now that you have your smart goals in place. Sort your goals into smaller jobs and decide which ones are most important. To tell the difference between what's important and what's urgent, use tools like the Eisenhower Matrix. Then, use your time and resources wisely. To stay organized and on track, you can use software and apps like Asana, Trello, or even a plain Excel sheet. During the planning phase, you should also think of possible problems and make backup plans. By thinking about problems ahead of time, you're not only fixing them, but also mentally getting ready to face them, which will make them less likely to get in the way of your progress and drive. Keeping track of your progress. This is where a lot of people fail, mostly because keeping track of success takes constant dedication. It's easy to make a plan and set a goal, but it's really hard to achieve them and figure out how well you did. To see how far you've come, use key performance indicators, KPIs, or clear goals. You can keep track of your progress by writing in a diary or using a computer tracking system. Active tracking isn't just a way to hold people accountable, it's also a way to get feedback that motivates them. Life often has other plans for us than the straight problem-free road we'd like to take to reach our good goal. This is where being strong and able to change come in handy. Being resilient means being able to get back up after failing or having a loss without losing your sense of purpose or self-worth. Adaptability is about changing your plans and standards in response to unforeseen hurdles without losing sight of your final ideal. Incorporate thoughtful practices like writing or mindfulness to build resiliency. These help in improving self-awareness, thereby allowing you to deal with setbacks in a more healthy way. Adaptability can be promoted by developing a broad skill set and fostering a network of teachers and peers who can give different views when you face roadblocks. Your journey toward a worthwhile ideal will never be a static task. It's a dynamic, changing process that demands constant input and adaptation. By setting smart goals, planning carefully, tracking your progress, and fostering resiliency and flexibility, you are providing yourself with a strong toolkit to make your worthy ideal a reality. Remember, as you travel the complex path toward your ideal, each day offers a new chance to perform many wins, to take one more step in the progressive realization of what you find valuable. In doing so, not only do you get closer to your final goal, but you also improve the trip itself, making it into a satisfying experience that describes success in the most complete sense. At the beginning, I said, what makes a child grow up into the human being he becomes? Well, this is the reason for that. Of course, he's the intersection of a DNA pool that goes back for thousands and thousands of years. His surroundings has an impact on him, of course, but what makes him become the person he becomes is that he becomes what he thinks about most of the time. It's as easy as that. We become what we think about most of the time and that's the strangest secret. This is why thinking is so vital. This is why a goal is so important, because we will become that. This is why people who make plans reach them. What's wrong with guys is not that they reach their goals. They do that. It's in setting them up. It's important to remember that if we just follow the crowd, all we'll get out of it is wishing we could do it all over again. We don't think you can either. We need individual goals, individual thoughts, and individual deeds if we want to amount to anything as people. And we should never follow the crowd. We have to love, help, and serve them 
because our success will depend on it. But we should never lose who we are by getting lost in what has historically been nothing more than a suffocating sea of indirection and purposelessness. Let's be picky about whose footsteps we follow if we want to be like someone. Remember to think, because this is the only life we have. We can become anything we think, and I believe that imagination is the only limit. Before we end this in-depth look at the psychology and philosophy of success, let's go back to the wise but simple quote by Earl Nightingale that has guided us. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. We've taken this idea from its traditional, materialistic and externally validating meanings to one that is based on psychological and philosophical wisdom. We've talked about a lot of different theories from Maslow's hierarchy of needs to how nihilism and ancient thought have affected the idea of a good ideal. We've also talked about the real steps that can be taken, the common mistakes that people make, and the life-changing possibilities for both individuals and society as a whole. As we draw to a close, I want to leave you with one last thought. Seeing success as a path, not a goal, can be the key to a happy life. IT frees us from the constraints of social standards, gives us the guts to define our own worthwhile ideal, and gives us the tools to get around the problems we'll inevitably face along the way. This way of looking at things lets us really get into our life's work, make connections that matter, and give back to a world that needs each person's unique gifts. As we deal with existential threats like climate change and social inequality, there has never been a greater need for a broad and compassionate definition of success, one that respects both the worth of each person and the web of our shared existence. As you move forward, think about your worthwhile goal, because success isn't some faraway peak that you have to climb. It's the ground you walk on every day as you pursue what counts. Remember that the more each of us sticks to our good ideas, the closer society gets to a future that is not only successful in the usual sense, but also smart, fair and kind. Let's not just talk about this idea in an academic way. Let's live it, embrace it and spread it. This isn't just a theory. It's a call to action and a plan for a meaningful life and a meaningful world. Have you ever watched a river run gracefully, going around rocks and other things in its way? It never rushes, but it always gets where it's going. Have you ever seen a tree grow and reach for the sky? It never strains, it just grows. Life has a natural beat and flow, like a dance that doesn't depend on force or strain, but still manages to do the impossible. What if I told you that you could use the same idea in your own life? What if giving up could help you reach your goals faster than years of hard work and force? Welcome to a trip into the deep thought of the East, where Wu Wei, the idea of not doing anything, is the most important thing. It's an idea that has changed the lives of many people, leading them to a life of unity, happiness and, yes, success but it goes against a lot of what we've been taught to believe in our fast-paced, constant world. The idea of getting something done without using force sounds like, at best, a beautiful dream, and at worst, just plain laziness. Wu Wei is neither, though. It takes a lot of skill to know when to move and when to stay still. Many of you may not know this word yet. This old Chinese word comes from Taoist thought and basically means not doing or not acting. But, as with many intellectual ideas that have been around for a long time, the message is much deeper than what it says in English. I don't mean to say that you should just sit there and watch things happen. Instead, it's about making sure that your actions are so in sync with how things normally go that everything just seems to work out. Imagine for a moment that a martial artist is standing still and waiting. The artist doesn't use extra force when their opponent hits. Instead, they use the power and energy they're given and move in a way that fits the situation. That's basically Wu Wei. 
Trusting that the universe or the Tao is always in a natural state of balance, I am able to tell when to make effort and when to let things happen naturally. The problem is that the DST principle of Wu Wei suggests the opposite of what most people think, that more work leads to better results. Really powerful things can happen when you don't do anything, when you stop, take a deep breath, or wait. I know, I know, it's strange, that we might be able to do more if we try less. If we let go of the need to control every result, we might find that outcomes are more in line with what we want. Think about the last time you tried to make something happen. You might have been trying to persuade someone to see things your way, or you might have been pushing hard for a work job to turn out a certain way. How did that make you feel? Tense, tiring, or frustrating? Now think of a time when you made a plan, did your part, and then let things happen. These two methods are not only different in what they do, but also in the way they get there. It is important to note that this is not an argument for inaction. In fact, it is the exact opposite. Wu Wei does a lot of things. I need to be very aware, pay close attention, and feel deeply connected to both myself and my surroundings. Being able to tell the difference between a place of force and a place of balance is very important. Before we start our journey, I want you to open your mind and heart to the wisdom of the East, to the lessons of the rivers, the trees, and the ancient sages who knew something deep about the universe. That by learning how to not try, we might just find the key to getting everything we want happily, easily, and with grace. Before we can fully understand Wu Wei, we need to go back in time and explore the landscapes of old China. It was there, on misty mountains and in quiet temples, that the first seeds of Taoism were planted. Philosophers in the East have thought about Wu for a very long time, and it's not just a passing thought or a recent trend. DSM, or Taoism as it is sometimes called, is an old spiritual and philosophy practice that has shaped Chinese society for more than 2,000 years. To the core of it all is the Tao, or Tao, which is often translated as the Wei. However, like Wu Wei, Tao is such a broad and deep term that it's hard to explain directly. People say that the Tao is the end, the cause, and the nature of all life. There is a universal dance of the Tao that the principle of Wu Wei finds its beat in. It is both the beginning and the end, the road and the journey. The Tao Te Ching, which was written by the mysterious figure Laozi and is the most important book in Taoism, has many wise words about this concept. The Tao never does anything, yet through it all things are done. If powerful men and women could stay centered in the Tao, everything would be in harmony. These lines make you feel the strange heart of this idea. The Tao, in its lack of action, creates all action. No amount of banging or noise can make the universe dance. It's the deep, quiet silence that does. We can get more done when we move with the natural order or connect with the Tao. There are other Eastern religions that value ideas like Wu Wei though. As we travel east from China, we reach Japan, a place where Zen Buddhism thrived. The principles of Zen, which stress meditation, awareness and being present, are similar to those of Wu Wei. Zen doesn't talk about not doing anything, but it stresses very much the state of being overdoing. Think about the Zen practice of Shikantaza, which means just sitting. If you do this kind of meditation, you don't have to think about or end anything. It's more about just living, being and watching. It's a bold act of pure presence where the yogi is not trying to reach knowledge, but is simply being in the present. Even though it seems inactive, this just being is a very active way to be in the moment, similar to Wu Wei. It's about being in sync, flowing with the flow and being in balance. Also, Zen and Taoism may be the most well-known, but many other Eastern faiths share similar ideas. For example, the old Indian theory of Nishkama Karma from the Bhagavad Gita 
talks about doing things without caring about the effects, which is a theme that fits well with Wu's ideas. I find it interesting to see that there seems to be a universal thread running through these beliefs, despite the differences in location, language, and culture. All of these things point to a deep truth. Sometimes the most meaningful things happen when we let go and dance with the bigger cosmic dance instead of forcing things to happen. There is a clear message. There is art and beauty in not trying, in just being, and in going with the flow of life. This is true whether you're thinking about the silent Tao that rules everything, the Zen master who sits in deep presence, or the Gita's call to act without attachment. While we are learning more about Eastern philosophy, the term Wu Wei keeps coming up as a way to help us understand a unique way of living. It's an interesting word that makes me think of silence and maybe even monks on remote mountains. But what does it really mean? First, let's talk about language. Wu Wei is a Chinese phrase. Wu means not or without, and Wei means doing or action. Together, they mean not doing or action. But this is where things get tricky. A quick reading could lead to the idea of sloth, stagnation, or quiet inaction. But that would be a terrible way to understand a deep theory that has been used as a guide by wise people, kings, and thinkers for hundreds of years. To compare this idea to the beauty of a dance, the dancers are so into the performance that every move doesn't feel like a planned step, but like a natural extension of who they are. It's the painter whose brush moves easily across the panel, not because of their conscious mind, but because of an unplanned spirit. This idea is not about not doing anything, but about doing something that is pure, something that isn't hampered by overthinking, planning, or pushing. To explain further, think about how water flows. I don't push or stretch, but it keeps moving, sculpting valleys and mountains over time. In the sense that we usually use the word try, water doesn't do anything. It just moves in a way that fits with its surroundings. Being in line with your nature and the nature of the universe without using extra power is what Wu Wei is all about. People often get the wrong idea about Wu Wei by thinking it means being lazy or not wanting to do anything. This is not at all true. Adopting this idea doesn't mean giving up on your goals or duties. Instead, it means that we need to change how we think about them. One example of this is a martial artist who practices Wu Wei. They don't use brute force to beat an opponent when they're in a fight. Instead, they use their deep knowledge of energy, motion and leverage to change the direction of forces so that the least amount of energy is used to have the most effect. Instead of using physical force, I take a coordinated, planned and effective action. Today, we could use the field of aeronautics to make a comparison. Think about the idea of mechanical efficiency when designing an airplane. To make planes move faster or higher, engineers don't just add more power. They also build the plane so that it has the least amount of air resistance possible. This lets the plane glide smoothly while using less fuel. This deep Eastern theory about life is like efficiency, where you get more done with less. This could mean that in a heated argument, you should listen more than you speak and let the talk flow so that everyone can understand instead of pushing a goal. In business, it could mean knowing how the market works and how people act and making sure that your plan fits with the currents instead of going against them. In sum, Wu Wei promotes a peaceful way of life in which actions come from a place of deep awareness, harmony and flexibility. It tells us to pay attention, figure out the beat and act when the time is right. It's about being able to sense how things rise and fall and making sure that our activities fit naturally into these cycles. The old knowledge of Wu Wei offers a calming, unusual view in a world that is constantly telling us to act, fight and push faster. It tells us that sometimes the most powerful thing is not how hard we can push, 
but how smoothly we can move. The natural world has always been a source of knowledge, showing us the greater facts of life. One thing that stood out as a great guide for the Eastern thinkers, especially Lao Tzu, was water. This simple, modest material that covers most of our blue world turns into a powerful image in the hands of the Taoist philosopher, giving us deep insights into what Wu Wei is all about. In many places in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu uses water as a metaphor to explain Wu's theory. The quote that stands out the most is, Nothing in the world is as soft and yielding as water, yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible, nothing can surpass it. Water doesn't like to fight, question, or rush. Still, it never gives up, never stops going, and always finds a way. Like a river that flows in a circle, it doesn't go in a straight line or push through things that are in its way. It slowly cuts away through the ground, changing the scenery around it over time. Water doesn't stop when it meets a rock or a peak. It just finds a way around, under, or over it. This is what Wu Wei is all about. Not using too much force, letting things happen as they may, and moving smoothly along the road with the least amount of trouble. Laozi's focus on water shows an important part of being resilient. Resilience may be mistaken for hardness or stubbornness in today's world, I think. But real strength, like water, comes from being able to change and adapt. Even though water changes form when put in different containers, it stays the same. It can be as soft as a dewdrop in the morning or as strong as a tidal wave, depending on the situation. It doesn't change what it is at its heart. In the same way, when we live by these principles, we become strong in a way that doesn't come from being stubborn or tough, but from knowing and going with the flow of life. When bad things happen, we don't break under the stress or fight against change. Instead, we learn to adapt, grow, and find new ways, just like water would. Every problem, like the rocks in a stream, is also a chance to make things right, look things over, and find a new way. The rocks don't stop the water, they just change the way it flows. In the same way, problems and failures are unavoidable in life. This way of thinking, which is summed up by the water image, tells us not to fight these problems with force or resistance, but with understanding and the ability to change. I can imagine experiencing a loss at work. Wu Wei says that we shouldn't fight it or stay sad about it. Instead, we should look at the situation, understand how it works, and then act in a way that fits with the present reality. We keep our bigger picture in mind. Like water, the trip may take unexpected turns, but we can still see where we're going. But water's quiet power may be the most impressive thing about it. IT nurtures, supports, carves valleys, and erodes mountains through steady, soft action, rather than in sudden, violent bursts. Water represents the paradox of Wu Wei in many ways, including being soft but strong, gentle but persistent, and flexible but firm at its core. Lao's comparisons of water to Wu Wei make us think about what it means to be strong and successful in a world where power is often associated with anger and success with never giving up. The water metaphor gives us a different story. It talks about a strength that isn't loud but deep, about accomplishments that don't come from fighting but from moving together in peace. When we follow Lao's lessons and Wu Wei's knowledge, we are not only taking a logical position but also a way of life in which we respect the flow, know the power of determination, see the strength in being soft, and most importantly, trust the trip. We will find our way in the end, just like water does, by making tracks and fates one small rippler at a time. When we think about the journey of ideas from the whispering pines of ancient China to the busy labs and lecture halls of 20th century psychology, there is an interesting meeting point. Wu Wei's wisdom meets modern psychological understanding in a term that interests thinkers, athletes, artists, 
and professionals alike, the flow state. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, a pioneer in the field of positive psychology, did important study that made the idea of flow known to a wider audience. From his point of view, flow is when a person is so involved in an action that they lose track of everything else. It seems like time bends, self-consciousness goes away, and the job at hand is the only thing that counts. I and Csikszentmihalyi's own words, flow is a state where people are so absorbed in a task that they seem to be unaware of everything else. People will do it even if it costs a lot because they enjoy it so much. The idea of effortlessness is at the heart of both Wu Wei and the flow state. In the sense of not having to work hard, but as a balanced position that takes away the feeling of pressure. It doesn't feel like you're trying too hard when you're in a flow state. Instead, choices and actions are made on the spot, based on instincts and past experiences. This fits with Wu Wei's beliefs that acts should be in line with the nature of the self and the universe, going beyond the level of forced effort. Being aware of the present moment is another thing that both beliefs have in common. People are firmly rooted in the present moment when they are in the flow state. They are not thinking about regrets from the past or worries about the future. They have turned all of their attention to the job at hand. In the same way, Wu Wei stresses how important it is to flow with the natural rhythms of the present, free from the weights of the past and the future. In both ideas, the world and how we fit in with it are very important. Individual skills are perfectly matched to the task at hand, according to Csikszentmihalyi's flow. In a perfect balance, neither boredom from a job that is too easy nor stress from a task that is too hard can win. This balance is very similar to Wu Wei's idea of coordinated action, which means acting in a way that is in sync with the outside world and not going too far or too little. The elevation of the self is a very interesting overlap. The ego and all of its worries and self-consciousness vanish when I'm in a flow state. No matter what they are doing, painting, running, writing, or anything else, they become it. This breaking down of the self gives a deep feeling of happiness and satisfaction. When I connect myself with the Tao, or way of the universe, I experience a similar transformation in Wu Wei's hug. One moves past the self and its narrow boundaries. One merges into a bigger fabric, a perfect union with the world around them, which makes them feel very peaceful and happy inside. The flow state has been connected to higher levels of inspiration, efficiency and well-being in the field of modern psychology. Flow can be seen in everything from sports setting new goals to artists creating works of art. The study by Csikszentmihalyi gives scientific support to what wise people from many centuries ago knew intuitively. Even though there is a huge gap in time and society between them, both points of view call for a life of unity, alignment and happy participation. I see a proof to the universality of some truths in the echoes between Wu Wei and the flow state. The message stays the same whether Lao uses literary metaphors or Csikszentmihalyi does actual research. True happiness and success don't come from working hard, but from being in sync with yourself, the job and the world. In the vast mosaic of human societies, each culture has its own distinctive brushstrokes that are shaped by geography, history and shared goals. When we move our focus westward from the calm waters of old Chinese knowledge, we see a very different way of life. The sound of doing is heard here with constant energy. But this never-ending march, which takes societies to high new heights, also leaves behind long shadows of tiredness and unrest. Let's look into this relationship and try to figure out where it came from, what it means and what problems it can cause. The Western world is a great example of how ambitious people can be, with its buildings reaching for the stars and its cities that never sleep. In the past, 
This part of the world has praised the idea of action. This idea is summed up by the American dream. Anyone can reach the top of the success ladder with hard work, drive, and a little luck. It's a way of thinking about getting what you want and crossing both internal and outward boundaries. In Renaissance Europe, there was a lot of innovation and discovery that praised the uniqueness and promise of each person. After that, the Industrial Revolution solidified the idea of never-ending production. Men and robots worked around the clock, changing economies and societies. In the modern era, this celebration of action has taken on new forms. The hustle-hard mantra of Silicon Valley startups, the focus on goal-setting and achievement in the self-help industry, and even our social media landscapes, which encourage constant engagement, all convey the same message. To be is to do. But this never-ending chase is dangerous, like Icarus flying higher and higher on wings made of wax. There are many effects that happen to people and to societies as a whole. Health groups like the World Health Organization now accept burnout as a real illness, even though it was once thought to be an oddity. Emotional tiredness, cynicism, and decreased productivity at work are all characteristics of IT. This isn't just being tired. The human spirit is deeply drained. Stress is something that many people always have with them because they feel like they have to be on, perform, and reach for the next goal. Several studies have shown that chronic stress is bad for your health, your mental health, and your general happiness with life. In a strange way, being obsessed with always doing something makes people less productive. We may be busy than ever, but that doesn't mean we are more productive. The myth of juggling, the inability to separate, and the decline of deep focused work are all to blame. When there is a lot going on, the standard of work, originality, and new ideas often suffer. There's a growing sense of spiritual void amidst the never-ending chaos. Many people start to wonder what the point of all their hard work is. Is it only to get more stuff, or to fit in with other people? Or is there something more to life that gets lost in the constant motion? The Western focus on getting things done has definitely led to amazing progress, new ideas, and higher living standards. But balance is important in everything. Since the pendulum has moved toward activity all the time, it might need to be adjusted. Eastern ideologies, like the idea of Wu Wei, we looked at, put more stress on being, unity, and behavior that is in line with what you believe. These qualities make us think about our constant pursuits. They suggest that sometimes letting go of forced effort, listening into the rhythms of nature and life, and accepting quiet in the middle of the storm might help us find not only peace, but also a deeper, more lasting and joyful productivity. Our world is becoming more and more linked, which means we need to have conversations with people from other cultures in order to understand the pros and cons of different points of view and create something that includes the best parts of both. I see a future in which success and happiness go hand in hand, where the waters of action and reflection meet and lead us to beaches of better understanding and happiness. In the bright light of old knowledge, vague ideas often seem to rise like clouds in the air. Nothing can take away from their beauty and depth, but how do we connect these big ideas to the real things that happen in our daily lives? How can someone use Wu Wei's peace and knowledge when they have to deal with schedules, digital distractions, and never-ending to-do lists? Let's start this journey together, looking for real-world methods that were inspired by Wu Wei and will help us get through our busy world with grace and purpose. The Grace of Letting Go by letting it go, it all gets done. The world is won by those who let it go. But when you try and try, the world is beyond the winning. L. One of the most important things to learn from Wu Wei is how powerful it is to do nothing, especially when doing something goes against what nature wants. Knowing when to stop, take a step back, 
or even give up on a job can be applied to our daily lives. For instance, if you're having trouble coming up with new ideas or are stuck in a fight with someone, it can help to step back, take a break and give yourself time to think things through. It's not loss or escape, it's deliberate not action, letting things happen as they should. In the workplace, this could mean knowing when to give someone else work to do and when to let them figure things out on their own. In personal relationships, it could mean choosing not to react without thinking, letting your feelings settle before reacting and learning to be patient. Nature doesn't rush, but everything gets done. Figuring out how life works. Trees don't grow overnight. The seasons change in a natural way and the universe also moves at its own pace. Wu Wei shows us that our lives have a flow, just like nature. Being patient doesn't mean you're idle or don't care. It just means you understand that you can't control everything right now. When you're waiting for a seed to sprout, a project to come to life, or a relationship to grow, patience is a powerful ally. It protects you from stress, the urge to jump in, or to speed up processes that need time to happen naturally. In real life, this could mean not constantly checking for responses after sending an important email, giving new team members time to adjust and fit in with the company cult. It's like trying to be the master carpenter while using the master carpenter's tools. You'll probably cut your hand. Because we're so focused on results, we sometimes think that working longer hours, taking on more tasks and pushing ourselves harder will lead to better results. Wu Wei disagrees with this idea. For example, if you try to write with a pen by pressing down too hard, not only will the W over preparing for an event could make you anxious and less able to deal with changes. Constantly pushing a team could lower morale. Forcing a relationship to move at an unnatural pace could strain or break it. The lesson here is to find the balance between doing and not doing making sure our efforts are in line with how things should naturally move forward. It's about trusting the process and giving our best, but also taking time to relax and enjoy the journey. It might seem hard to follow Wu Wei's lessons in the modern world, but these ancient teachings aren't against action. They're just a better way to do it. It's about getting in tune with life's flow and knowing when to act, when to wait and when to back off. As we incorporate these lessons, we find that the ancients' wisdom can indeed illuminate our modern paths, leading us to a life of balance, fulfillment, and deep understanding. There are many stories in the world that show how the ideas of Wu Wei can be applied, even if the main characters don't directly mention this Eastern philosophy. These stories can be set in boardrooms, sports arenas, artist studios, or personal lives, and there's a lot of evidence to show that sometimes less really is more. Let's travel through these different settings and find stories where simple actions made all the difference. How 3M's post-it notes were made. The post-it note, one of the most famous business products of all time, was actually the result of an experiment gone wrong. In 1968, Dr. Spencer Silver, a scientist at 3M, was trying to make a super strong adhesive, but instead he made a low-tack, reusable, pressure-sensitive adhesive. For years, this mistake seemed to have no use, and it wasn't until 1974 that a co-worker named Art Fry realized what had happened. The Beatles let it be. When you're working on something creative, it can be hard to keep your ideas straight. During a time of disagreements within the band and pressure from outside sources, Paul McCartney had a dream in which his dead mother told him, let it be. This dream not only inspired the song, but it also became a way of life for McCartney and the rest of the Beatles. Instead of trying to be creative in the midst of chaos, they let things happen. Before 1954, people thought it was impossible to run a mile in less than four minutes. But Roger Bannister, a medical student and runner, took on the challenge with a different mindset. 
While many athletes were increasing their training schedules, Bannister decreased his. He believed in quality over quantity and made sure that each training session had a purpose and was in line with his goals. He didn't force himself into too many routines or the story of Julia and the unplanned journey. Julia, a marketing professional, had carefully planned a solo trip to Italy. Every hour was scheduled and every site to be seen was written down. But on her second day, a sudden gust of wind in Venice blew away her itinerary. With no internet access and a dead phone battery, she had to decide whether to panic or let the city lead her. She wandered through alleys and found hidden gems. These stories from different areas all share one truth. There is magic in not forcing outcomes and knowing when to act and when to yield. They show how harmonious life can be when people, despite their natural desire to control and predict, align themselves with the more natural, often random flow of existence. This is true whether they are in the throes of innovation, the swirl of creativity, the adrenaline of sports, or the unpredictability of personal journeys. The gentle whisper of Wu Wei, beckoning us toward the allure of effortlessness, feels almost audacious in the dizzying whirlwind of our modern age, where the relentless drumbeat for ceaseless effort and pursuit resonates in every corner. It's realizing that sometimes the best thing we can do is nothing at all, letting life's current carry us forward instead of swimming against it all the time. But this isn't a call to be passive or give up on our goals and dreams. Rather, it's a dance between knowing when to lead and when to follow, between steering the ship and letting the winds guide us. It's about changing how we think about success, not as tea. Still, this conversation would be incomplete without your input. As we come to the end of this exploration, we invite each of you to share your stories of serendipity, of times when not doing something lit up your path, or of times when letting go led you to places you never thought possible. We also encourage you to try out Wu's ideas in your daily life. For by sharing and trying them out together, we not only improve our own lives, but we also. If we accept Wu Wei, maybe we'll find that life's deepest truths aren't shouted from the mountaintops, but whispered in the quiet hallways of understanding, waiting for those who are willing to listen to find them. Let's start this journey together, making paths lit by the soft glow of effortless action, and in doing so, change the shape of a life well lived.